All right. Hi, everyone. Um, hi again. Um, I think we'll just give a couple more minutes um, and we'll get started as soon as we, I think there's quite a few people coming in when there's a little bit of a, a trickle. When it goes down to a trickle, I think we can get started. I think right now it's still, people are still coming in. All right. I think we can get started. Um, good afternoon, everybody. And I'm super happy to welcome you to Neurofarm India 2021, which is organized by Biosports India. Um, this conference is being run in collaboration with the Alba Network, which has generously agreed to sponsor the event and our media partner in Psycom. Uh, I'm Vaishnavi Anantanaranan and I'm one of the founders of Biaswatch India and I am an EMBL Australia group leader at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. Until very recently, I was a faculty member at the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. And uh, before we go on, I'd like to give you a very quick overview of what Biaswatch India is and what we do at Biaswatch India and what we hope to do in the future as well. So let me just, just go ahead and quickly start sharing my screen. Just give me a second. All right, here we go. I hope everybody can, see, everybody can see my screen. Yeah, let me know if you can't see something. Somebody can, uh, one of the panelists can unmute themselves and tell me if you can't see the screen. But essentially, Biaswatch India was founded by uh, myself and Shruti in uh, mid 2020, I'd say. So what is Biaswatch India? Uh, Biaswatch India is a collective to help highlight the lack of women representation and gender imbalance in Indian STEM talks, conferences, workshops, and panels. Um, to give you a very quick history of how this started, to technically, Shruti uh, tweeted out in April 2020, I think, if I remember right, um, asking if um, there's somebody out there who'd like to start an initiative of the sort. Um, and I raised my hand up and said, yes, let's do it. Um, to, technically, the uh, idea of Bias Watch India was born out of frustration that we weren't seeing enough women experts on high-level panels in Indian academia. And uh, Bias Watch India is, in fact, uh, modeled on another initiative of, um, of a similar kind called Bias Watch Neuro, which um, Shruti was familiar with at the time, which is a Bias Watch for the neuroscience field. So... Why is our work important? Um, this, I think, is a picture that many of us are familiar with. Um, Indian science has very few women voices and representation. 
uh, and women scientists are regularly excluded from science conferences, panel discussions, awards, promotions, uh, you name it. So Bias Watch India was formed to highlight these inequities and provide real-time actionable data as a basis for future remedial steps. Um, our mission is to increase awareness of panels, uh, essentially all male panels, to empower students and academicians to call out panels when they see them, and to document the lack of women representation in STEM fields in Indian academia. Um, we want to also provide up-to-date data on base rates for future policy making. Um, how do we go about actually doing what we do at Bias Watch India? So we typically rely on our Twitter feed or our network of colleagues and friends who alert us to conferences that are happening in Indian STEM, or we do a simple web search to look at conferences that are happening in a period of time. Uh, this is an example of a conference that was held a little while ago. Uh, we go to conference websites or pull out their posters and look at the number of women speakers. And in this, um, in this poster, you'll see that the women speaker ratio is uh, six out of 18 or uh, one in three. And this is what essentially we use as a marker for how well a conference is doing in terms of women representation. This is nothing but a women speaker ratio. Uh, but for this number to make sense in context of the actual proportion of women in Indian academia, we had to calculate another number called a base rate, which we define as the ratio of the number of women scientists or faculty members to the total number of faculty or uh, faculty members or scientists. Um, I see a lot of hands being raised. Is everything okay? I'm going to presume that's all right. Otherwise, one of the panelists can unmute themselves and let me know if something's wrong. Um, yeah, so the base rate is essentially the ratio of number of women scientists or faculty members by the total number of scientists or faculty members. Um, so what we do is essentially go to uh, the websites of these conferences, uh, sorry, of these, uh, of these institutes. We have a list of um, several institutes that we look at. Uh, so we actually had pulled, these, uh, pulled up these institutes from DSC's uh, page. And we're going through the list, but we started off at the top ranked institutes and universities of India. Um, so we go to their websites and we actually visit individual web pages and look at the, the number of women faculty members in each of their departments. So we have been looking at base rates for biology, chemistry, computer science, earth science, and so on. These are broad classifications, of course, but at some point we want to try and see if we can narrow this down even further. And we also get an overall uh, base rate for the uh, total proportion of women scientists, um, uh, and we call this as science. Um, so if you look at the data that we've acquired thus far, uh, we've analyzed as far, we've acquired a little more data, but we haven't had the time to yet analyze all of it. But we've looked at 47 top ranked Indian universities and institutes. Um, and each of these dots here represents an, a specific institute in the country. Um, and essentially the base rate in for the all of biology in this instance turned out to be 0.23, which is in which is indicative of the fact that the 23% of faculty members in biology in India are women. And this number, of course, as you can see, varies all the way from 0.08 or 8% for engineering. And the highest after that is uh, a, a below biology is math, which is 15%. Overall, if you look at the total base rate of women in Indian science, we get a number of 0.11 or 11%. So this, as you can see, is quite a small number. Um, and of course, that's what the reality is at this point in time. So how do we then go ahead and look at our conferences that we get data for? So we get, uh, we so far acquired con uh, data from 167 conferences uh, held between June and October, 2020. So we have, again, classified this according to um, the field that we're looking at. And each of these data points here represents the proportion of women scientists uh, for a specific conference in this instance. The red bar here is indicating what the base rate is for that field. Uh, if you remember from the previous slide, for biology, the base rate is 0.23 or 23%. 
And if you look at the median proportion of women scientists in these conferences in biology that were held in the large realm of biology, this is not very different from the existing base rate in the field. Uh, and that's true also for earth science, uh, sorry, for, in, for most of the conference, uh, most of the conferences we saw actually were close to the base rate, but some were actually quite a bit lower, as you can see for chemistry, computer science, math, especially, and physics. So some of these um, conferences essentially were underrepresenting, I'll, I'd say a large proportion, in fact, were underrepresenting women. So when the median proportion of women scientists is lower than the base rate for that field, it means that you are sampling fewer women than there are in the field, meaning you're inviting fewer women, right? So that's essentially what's happening when you look at the conferences that we have looked at. Um, but as, you, as I just pointed out a little while ago, there isn't that big a difference between the proportion of women scientists that are being invited to conference and the base rate of the field. Does that mean then that there aren't really any manuals or that those are a thing of the past? Uh, you'll be surprised to see, maybe you won't be, but you'd see that in fact, there are several conferences that feature absolutely no women. The hollow circles here in black represent um, manners uh, or conferences that feature no women speakers. And the blue triangles here are representative of those conferences that had women speaker ratios below the base rate for that field. So in fact, if you look, tally up all of the conferences we looked at, 40% of the conferences had no women speakers which is quite a really, I mean, if you think about it, it's a really, really large number, right? And in fact, 50%, one in two conferences actually had con women speaker ratios below the base rate for that field, meaning they were underrepresenting women. Um, so this is as it as data as it stands right now, we're continuing to look at, um, get more data for institutes as well as, of course, adding continually to the conference database. Um, what we want to try and do in the future is to look at a bunch of different kinds of analyses, um, career stage of women that were invited versus the base rate of uh, women scientists based on the career stage, stuff like that. Um, what we also want to do in the future is fund women students to take up summer internship in women scientist labs. This is something we've been planning for a bit and hopefully soon we'll be able to action this. Um, we have, in fact, already funded conferences that have women speaker ratios of at least 30%. And uh, we plan in the past to conduct conferences that feature only women speakers to showcase talented women scientists. And in fact, you are here at the very first conference of the sort, Neuroform Inter 2021. Um, I would like to end this section of um, acknowledging um, people that worked with Bias Watch India through the, since its inception. Liba, Metali, Joel, and Harsh initially volunteered to do a lot of the base rate collection. Radhani and Ravi, in fact, have uh, worked with us as interns to actually collect more data for base rate uh, calculations. Uh, Abhishek has been a super strong um, support for us uh, for, uh, for his um, input into the analysis as well as looking at how to increase our base rates and so on. Uh, we are funded currently by uh, the EMBO Young Investigator Award. Um, and you can check out our Twitter and web page. Uh, most of you probably did already. That is why you're here. I will stop this presentation now, but I'd like to continue by giving you a little more information about what this conference is about. Um, so the Neurofarm India database, which is at the heart of this conference, is a curated collection of information on primarily women neuroscientists who are faculty members at research institutes across India. Uh, in the future, we will we hope to find ways to systematically include more scientists from underrepresented genders in all of Biaswatch India's efforts towards making Indian STEM a more inclusive space. So a little more about this conference. Uh, I promise I only will take a few more minutes. Um, so this conference is about showcasing the scholastic range and expertise of women neuroscientists in India, as well as making a powerful statement about the possibility of better representation and support for scientists of all genders in Indian academia and the world at large. Uh, in most cases, conferences, panel discussions, and other avenues of engagement and outreach often mirror and magnify systemic inequities that hold people back from giving their best to the professions they love. 
But this time and with this specific conference, we want to break that precedent and instead let women show everyone what they can do. Um, I will end really soon by giving you a very quick preview into the coming attractions through the conference. So here we'll be hearing from 30 women scientists from across the entire range of neuroscience, starting from neuronal diseases and going all the way to cognitive neuroscience. Uh, we have field leaders who will provide a historical overview of development in their chosen field. And this will be followed by researchers who will give deep dive presentations into projects representing this key research interest and also give a little bit of a glimpse into their career path um, as they went along. Um, researchers will also spend some time discussing their work with students uh, and postdocs from chosen from amongst our audience in our breakout rooms. And while the scientific talks serve as the uh, core of this conference, they will be supported by a set of special events that will dig deep into the socio-cultural issues that complicate practice of science in India. The ALBA network session on bias in Indian STEM and the gender awareness and sensitization workshop by Ungenda will shine a much needed light on social and personal biases that prevent us from making science the supportive and inclusive space that it desperately needs to be to function as the bulwark that India and the rest of the world can depend on in these difficult and uncertain times. And with this, I'm going to stop um, my introduction. If you, I think we have a few time, uh, a little bit of time for questions. So if somebody has some burning questions, happy to answer them. If you have any questions about Bias Watch India, now's the time to ask. All right, if there's no questions on the Bias Watch India front, um, I'm going to, oh, there is a question. Somebody raised their hand, but I can't see that anymore. Oh, somebody wants to know how we can, how somebody can volunteer for Bias Watch India. Do write to us at biaswatchindia at gmail.com um, and tell us uh, how and why you'd like to help. Um, oh, same, same to you, uh, Esas. Uh, thanks for writing uh, and asking how you can help with what we're doing. Um, essentially, you can write to us right now. The primary help that we need uh, is actually um, to do with um, getting the base rates that you might have seen in my presentation. Right, so that's quite uh, that's quite uh, a bit of a job. So we've been getting a lot of people to help us with that. There is a question from Devashish. Uh, Devashish, would you like to uh, unmute myself, unmute yourself and chat, or would you like to just go ahead and type your question in the chat or Q and A box, whichever you feel comfortable with? Okay, Devashish is typing. We will wait with bated breath. Cool. Uh, there's a question from Shristi. Um, how does how does I guess Bias Watch India aim to improve female participation in STEM? So, like I mentioned, Shristi, we have been starting a bunch of initiatives to actively uh, encourage women um, undergraduate students and uh, graduate students to remain in science uh, by getting them internships in women scientist labs. Um, we are funding conferences, so the, which feature 30, at least 30 percent women speakers. Um, and we conduct conferences like this, which showcase all the excellent work that women scientists are doing in India. Uh, more than anything, I think what we're hoping to do with Bias Watch India is to get the awareness going about how um, poorly women are represented in Indian science and get conversations going about how to change that. And hopefully what we, we, what we will see in the future is that um, the Indian admin, science administration takes notice and has an active part in the work that we are doing. Uh, I think there's a question, Devashish's question was, can Indian graduate students who are pursuing PhD abroad contribute to Bias Watch India? 
Absolutely. Um, we don't, uh, when, I, when I say we have interns, um, we, they are, don't work on the same, same time zone as us. In fact, the interns that we had, um, Ravi and Hradhani, Ravi is in Lisbon and Hradhani is in India. Shruti is in the US, I am in Australia, so we're all in different time zones. It doesn't, you don't need to be in uh, physically based in India. Uh, you can work on your, on your schedule. We just essentially meet up every once in a while to figure out how to go forward. So absolutely, do write to us if you're interested in helping us. Um, the, I think Tanvi has a question about summer internships. Um, the internships haven't yet started. We were hoping to have in-person in, uh, internships, maybe the regular internships, um, started this year. Uh, we were hoping, we were quite optimistic, Shruti and I, in thinking that we Hi everybody, um, I hope you can hear me. It looks a little bit like Vaishnavi is having trouble reconnecting. Um, I am happy to sort of take over answering the questions since there are a few of them around. Um, I was just answering Shriya's question but uh, on text, but I can quickly answer it uh, live if that's all right. So uh, she's asking if we're looking at using science communication as a tool to address this issue. Um, I don't know which tool you're specifically talking about, but for us, the most important thing right now is to focus on getting the basics and making sure that, you know, um, we reflect what is on this, what is on the ground today as it is, because most of the feedback <laughs> and most of the criticism that we get is uh, focused on, oh, how do you know there are enough women? How do you know there aren't enough women? And so on. Um, and so, yes, hopefully in the future, we will try to take some measures to include sort of science communication ways of answering these things, but um, we'll see how it goes. Uh, if you want more uh, information and resources, you can go to our BiSearch India uh, webpage. And uh, we have a small tab there called resources, which actually has a lot of information about how things are right now. Uh, so feel free to head there and sort of read up on, on what we are doing and what the ground reality is. Um, let's see. Sweet. Uh, I think I can see, yeah, uh, that's great, Shia. And I can see Priyam Narayan. How can Biosmart India help women who face vices in faculty position appointments and recruitment to scientific positions? That's exactly what we're trying to do um, by, by showing how bad things are. Um, we hope to sort of move the needle uh, on policy making and, and hopefully convince policy makers, uh, especially science policy makers, now that, you know, STIP 2020 is sort of up, um, convince them that it's a problem, you know, allocate more money to, to sort of gender equitable uh, policies, uh, allocate more time and more information and sort of gather more information and try to figure out what exactly is going on to make sure things are at a level playing field for men and women and people of all genders in Indian science. So this is hopefully a small effort uh, in that direction. Um, yeah, it looks like Vaishnavi is back. So I'm just gonna hand it over to her. Sorry, I have no idea what happened there and I my computer didn't let me sign back in. I had to shut it down and start again. Um, but at that, I think that actually gives us, if, if, if are there any more questions that uh, we have? 
Otherwise, not that I, I can see. If anybody has any more questions, feel free to leave them on the Q and A box. Um, I will yes. try to answer them in text. But I think it's time we move on to our next event. Sure. Um, so with this, I'm happy to hand off uh, hand the stage off to our MC for the day, uh, Dr. Poonam Tagore. Go ahead, Poonam. All right. Uh, okay. So hello, everyone. I am Poonam Thakur. I am an assistant professor at ISER Thiruvananthapuram. Uh, today, I'll be handling the mic for today's session with Dr. Sushmita Jha. She is an associate professor at IIT Jodhpur. Both of us are the members of the core organizing committee for this conference. We will also be helped by lead volunteers of the day, Amartya Pradhan and Annapurna PK. They will be helping you in case of any technical glitches on Zoom that you might face. And overall, we want to ensure that all of you can have productive interaction with our speakers and uh, among the audience as well. Okay. And as you would have seen in our event posters for the day, we will be having uh, public talks by six speakers. This will be followed by private breakout rooms from 4.30 to 5 p.m. Indian Standard Time. Um, this is to facilitate some extended discussion between speakers and selected members of the audience. Before we begin, we would like to uh, give a little bit of uh, notice to audience. Uh, first of all, we would like to request all of our attendees to kindly add their preferred pronouns along with their display or Zoom names. This is to foster a spirit of inclusivity and openness to this conference. And uh, this is very, very simple to do. All you have to do is just write, uh, go to the right hand side of your name where it is appearing and just add your preferred pronouns after your name. And second point that we would like to mention is that we are also live streaming this conference on YouTube. So in case anyone is attending on YouTube or ones who have not registered, uh, they can you know, uh, continue to watch this event there. Uh, the link will be added in the chat box so you can also see it there and we will be monitoring the youtube chat stream constantly in addition to the one on zoom so that we can pick up the questions for our speakers um, another notice that we will not be taking any audience questions for the field leader talks uh, the ones who will be giving overview of the fields but for all other talks and sessions we highly encourage participation from audience you are most welcome to ask, uh, ask questions and engage um, with the, the speakers. And uh, just an important notice, it would be great if you could type all of your questions in the Q&A box and use the chat uh, box to uh, interact with other attendees. Um, and if your question that you wanted to pose has already been asked in Q&A, please still ensure to upvote that so we know which question holds most attention from the audience. And in case of limited time, we can pick up the most asked questions uh, for the speakers. Okay, with all of this housekeeping instructions done, let's get started for the day. So I, uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Vidita Vedya. She's a professor at Department of Biological Sciences at TIFR Mumbai. In her research, she investigates the neurocircuitry of emotion, how it is modified by life experiences, and how its alterations underpin uh, the psychiatric disorders like anxiety and depression. Uh, she has a very stellar CV. She is a fellow of, fellow of Indian National Science Academy, Indian Academy of Sciences, and a winner of National Bioscientist Award 2012, as well as Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Award in 2015. Currently, she serves as the vice chairperson of the Council of Scientists at International Human Frontier Science Program. Today, she is going to represent the subfield of neuronal disease and give a talk focused on the history and importance of this field. Dr. Vedya, thank you for accepting our invitation to talk in the conference and over to you. Thanks, Poonam. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here. And I'm actually going to put off my video only because uh, bandwidth is poor and I uh, don't want to get, uh, you know, to lose signal. And I'll come back on once the slides are done. Um, let me just share my slides. Poonam, can you just confirm that you can see the slides? Yes, I can. 
Okay, great. So when Shruti and Vaishnavi asked me to do this particular session and to be part of it, I was very excited by the idea, first of all, of a Neurofem India conference and uh, the, the fact that we are organizing to bring together the women neuroscientists in the country is itself an interesting effort. And so kudos to you all for uh, putting this together. But this is an impossible task. So I was struggling on how do you introduce research on neurological neuropsychiatric disorders in India from a perspective of really looking at both basic fundamental and applied research in the spectrum of things that are associated with brain disorders. Um, how do I even attempt to do it? So I'm going to start by caveating and saying it is impossible to do. And so I've already started with the apology right at the very beginning. And I'm going to say it is it is just an impossible task. So what I'm going to do is actually not do that. I'm going to give a, really a historical perspective, focusing on very few women neuroscientists who shape this field. It's impossible to include everyone. So the apologies at the very beginning about leaving out tons of people. I'm literally going to talk about four or five people, not because they had the greatest impact, not because, um, because I feel that those were the names that immediately popped into my mind, but because they reflect the landscape in this field over the last 30, 40, 50 years. And their stories are reflective of what was happening and what was really changing across India in this space across the last 50 years. And that's the reason I've picked a subset of names. I've also only focused on women neuroscientists and not talked about what was going on um, in general in neuroscience because this, that didn't seem to me the purview for this particular uh, discussion today. And so that's I'm limited in what I'm discussing, uh, discussing today. Let's ask ourselves, is it important in a country like India to have neuroscience research that is focused on neurological and neuropsychiatric disorders? And here's an article that Vijay Ravindranath and several other people, um, neuroscientists from low and middle income countries put together, published now more than five years ago, six years ago, but um, very relevant to our understanding of just the disease burden that we have currently in our country. And this is, of course, slightly old data, but it gives you a sense of the fact that there's a substantial disease burden, often disproportionate in low and middle income countries because of the circumstances that might be economic, environmental, um, individual distinct challenges that are noticed in LMICs, which are distinct from high income countries. And this is important for us to just rest our eyes on for a second or two. And then if you look at the right hand side, it tells you about the number of papers in the broad neuroscience space that are emerging from these countries. And you'll see that the purple line is India. And I just want to give you a sense that we're not providing a large number of papers into the broader neuroscience community. And even if you now break that down into a fraction and ask what proportion of that includes um, you know, corresponding authors who are women, you will find that it is a far smaller fraction of that. This needs to grow, period, it needs to grow, as in you need more neuroscience research in the country, but you also need a healthy representation of from half of your population. Uh, if you don't have it from that half itself, then you can forget about diversity of other sorts. It's really missing, right? So, I mean, economic diversity itself, we all carry privilege. The fact that we're sitting here on Zoom and having this discussion already tells us the sliver of society that has access to being able to even do neuroscience research. So how do I even attempt to do this? How do I tell a little story in 15 minutes that highlights what happened in our country over the last several decades, focused on research associated with neurological and neuropsychiatric conditions. And for us to do that, we need to go back to the fact that in a sense, neuroscience in the country was originally seeded from the medical sciences community. It came from neurologists and neurosurgeons. And that's where the birth in a sense really of substantial neuroscience originally showed up, okay? I'm talking about the early 60s, the late 50s, the early 70s, okay? So 1950s, 60s, and 70s. And it's really a conglomeration of CMC Vellor, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, and the Madras Medical College, where these ideas are seeded and an MD program in neurology and then neurosurgery is kick-started. And it's really in those stories that you start hearing about the first women 
who entered this space. And perhaps the earliest one that I should be referring to, and I would love to be corrected on this, is, is Vimla Virmani. Vimla Virmani was a neurologist um, at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. She headed the neurology department there. And she was also the first president of the Neurological Society of India. Many of us who are neuroscientists may not automatically know about her. And that itself is interesting because we do know about other neurologists and neurosurgeons who have played a leading role. And this includes Dr. P.K. Seth, um, you know, Dr. P. N. Tandon. There are so many names here that I could go down the list of, many whose names we are aware of, but we may not necessarily know of women who played an important role in that era and in that time. And it's interesting because in her first, so she was the first woman president of the Neurological Society and her work was extensively in the area of neuromuscular dysfunction. And she mentioned at her presidential address that the Association of Medical Women in India was formed in 1907 and it preceded the Indian Medical Association, which only formed in 1916. And that's a fascinating little nugget of history to think about that actually the Association of Medical Women in 1907 precedes this idea, the idea that women may have thought it is necessary to already organize in 1907. This is medical professionals organizing at that point in time. It is interesting that more than a, you know, a century later, Eurofem India is seeding such a thought, right? Uh, is there a neuroscience community of women neuroscientists span this country who may organize to push to see greater equity and representation? And that's an important point. Uh, more than 100 years ago, this idea was already seeded by the medical community within the country. And I'd, I'd encourage people to read some of the articles that have emerged in Neurology India that talk about women from these times. And it was really AIMS, right? So AIMS had already a presence in neurology and neurosurgery. And many of the people who then seeded organizations later kick-started there. One example I'm going to tell you about is about people who've gone back and forth, down south and up north. Here is Dr. Gauri Devi, and I'm quoting her when she said in the 1960s, the course in neurology was commenced at Madras, Vellore, and Ames. And she was in the first batch of Ames under the tutelage of Professor Baldev Singh, again, another stalwart of uh, the neuroscience neurology community at that time, who was called Papa Neuron. It's interesting that we don't have a mama neuron. I mean, we have we may have issues with this with this epithet in itself. Uh, the idea of calling anyone either papa neuron or mama neuron may not necessarily sit well with us. But conceptually, it's an interesting idea. An interesting idea that it was really individuals who seeded the growth in this country. And Dr. Gavri Devi credits Professor Baldev Singh, Professor Tandon, many others as being the people under whom she developed a deep interest in neurology and eventually neuroepidemiology. And I'm just citing her most cited paper here, uh, which is looking at prevalence in Bangalore across urban and rural areas of neurological disorders. And I want you to draw your attention to the fact that she looks at the sex specific prevalence rate as well. It is important to have women in positions that do this sort of research as well, because an element of diversity, an element of a different way of looking at things starts coming in and that's critical. We need multiple voices. We need multiple ways of approaching the same problems. So this story back and forth between Ames and the South and the South and Ames continues. Most recently, if you think about it, I can think of Padma Srivastava who was supposed to take over Nimhan's directorship and would be moving from Ames down south. She was the second woman director uh, of Nimhan's after Gauri Devi. Gauri Devi retired as a vice chancellor of Nimhan's, was director of Nimhan's, and then moved back up north. The interesting theme that seems to show up. She's also been the recipient of the prestigious Vimla Virmani oration. So there is a link here. Her work in stroke, multiple sclerosis, vascular dementia, critical care neurology profoundly important to the neurology department and also to, to, to just the general community. She's extensively worked in, in many committees as well. Here's again another idea, the idea of going back and forth, up north, down south, right? That's, we, we see these examples of Dr. Gauri Devi, Vimla Virmani, Padma Srivastava. I am just using a few names, but there are plenty more. Gomati Gopinath, 
um, you know, Madhuri Bihari, there are so many names and I'm nowhere going to be able to cover all of those. But the idea was about 40, 50 years ago, it was seeded by neurologists and neurosurgeons first. And that's when it expanded much further than that to include individuals who had a PhD in neuroscience, which was not the common frame of the Indian Academy of Neurosciences or even Neurology India when it originally started, which was very much medical professionals looking at the problem of brain disorders. Expanded much further and beyond that. Vijay is a good example of that because she did this back and forth movement as well. She started at Nimhans and then moved up north. And this is just a little quote from her interview where she talks about setting up NBRC and that really, if you look at the seeds of those ideas, those ideas actually come from AIMS originally. The notion of having a national brain research center originates in the neurosurgery department at AIMS. It's interesting how a few institutions can play a very large role, a disproportionately large role in terms of seeding uh, areas of research. And then Viji moves back to center of neuroscience at to set up Center of Neuroscience at ISC, and then the Center for Brain Repair, which is in the process of being seeded with substantial endowment fund, funds. Why am I bringing this up? And why is it interesting to think about this? Because we can ask ourselves some questions. Are there patterns to, that we see? Okay. Are there strong institutional leaders that create environments that drive substantial presence within a field. And that is absolutely true for AIMS. It's true for CMC Vellore. It's true for NIMANS. It's disproportionately men. But if you look at the women leaders, in many cases, they've also come from those same environments. Why does it work for some women, but not for a large majority? Are there support structures and huge advantages of privilege that offset the challenge of gender bias? How does one systemically address this? And almost 40, 50 years later, what has actually changed, right? That's the question one can start asking oneself. What has systematically changed? There are definitely more women. There are more voices at the table. How many of us are using our voices at that table? That becomes a natural question to ask next. Can we do this just by ourselves? And should everyone be attending Neurofem India be largely women? Not at all. We need all the allies we can get Reliable support for this is it's not just a problem for women. It's diversity, equity, inclusion is a collective community problem. How do we break silos, especially for those of us who are in the in the field of looking at brain disorders? How do we talk to neurologists, neurosurgeons, psychiatrists? Is an MD pro PhD program being seeded pan country in multiple institutions? The need of the R. How is it that we can organize to dream big and imagine pan-India large projects that drive cutting-edge neuroscience research? Is there a way to bring multiple people together to do it? And is there a need for Neurofem India? And hopefully over the next couple of days, we'll see if there really is a need. I'm excited about the possibility. Getting women neuroscientists to organize, to talk to each other itself is relevant and important in my point of view, but maybe the jury's out, we'll wait and watch. There is no way I could have done justice to summarizing this. How does one even talk about all the research that happens pan our country, which is relevant and related to brain disorders? All we can say is that things have changed substantially from the 1970s and the 1980s. And yet there's a way, way longer way and distance to grow and go, right? Um, again, you can see the representation is cities and it's not complete, it's a few. It tells you how urban we are and how much our presence is not felt pan country and is lopsided in representation. Today, we're gonna to have the excitement of listening to wonderful young researchers entering this broad area. And that's really the future, right? So, but there are leads that we can take from historical examples that tell us much about how this shaped and how it has changed. It's so not true that all of that will apply to our stories necessarily, but there's always value in looking at a historical perspective of how your field has evolved in your own country. Uh, I don't have much else to add to this. And since there aren't any questions that are going to be targeted at uh, right at the very beginning, it's my pleasure to actually introduce the first speaker, Anupama Satyamurti. 
Uh, Anupama is a Ramalinga Swami Fellow at the Indian Institute of Science at the Center for Neuroscience there. She also has an Ibro Return Home Fellowship and an, was an NIH Fellow uh, Award for Research Excellence. Her interests are in looking at the contribution of distinct cells and circuits to controlling movement and understanding how this might be relevant to conditions such as ataxia. And she uses genetic strategies, et cetera, to actually look at the contribution of specific neurocircuits in moving, behaving mice. So I'm going to hand over to Anupama. Her title of her talk is Brain Proposes and Spinal Cord Disposes, Organization and Function of Cerebellospinal Neurons. Um, all yours, Anupama. Uh, thank you so much, Vidita. I hope everybody can hear me and see me. Yes, Anupama. Okay. Okay, okay. Um, so, and you can thank see you my person. screen, right? Hello? Can you see my screen? Yes, Anupama, please. Get okay, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Vidita. Um, so, good afternoon, everyone. So, first of all, I would really like to thank uh, Bias Watch India for this opportunity to share my work today and, and also for all the effort that they've been putting into making science accessible for all. And um, also I'm honored to be part of this community of Indian women neuroscientists. So thank you. So here at IISC, our lab is interested in understanding the neural mechanisms underlying motor control. So specifically, we are interested in dissecting the contribution of neurons that connect uh, distinct parts of the brain and the spinal cord to various aspects of movement, such as control of speed, um, control of direction, orientation, et cetera. So to a large extent, um, what got me interested in motor control is, is a serendipitous discovery that I made as a postdoc in um, Ariel Levine's lab uh, a couple of years ago at the National Institutes of Health. And uh, that's the work that I'll be sharing today for the most part. Okay, so today I would like to begin by showing you a relief from almost uh, 2000 years ago. So here you can see a wounded lioness. She's got all these arrows that are lodged in different regions of her spine. But if you look at her posture closely, you can see that she's paralyzed specifically from the waist down. So almost 2000 years ago, even though we didn't have the slightest clue as to how we produce movements, somehow there was this realization that the connection between these two squishy pieces of tissue, the brain and the spinal cord, needs to be intact for an animal to be able to move. Now, why is that the case? So first of all, we know different parts of the brain control different aspects of movement. So for example, the motor cortex is essential for initiating movements, the vestibular system for maintaining balance and so on. But to transform these motor commands into movements, these different brain areas need to talk to the spinal cord because that's where the motor neurons are. And these motor neurons are the only output neurons of the entire nervous system and are the only neurons that can directly give go signals to muscles. But that's not the only thing. The spinal cord is not just one giant relay station that passively connects the brain and the spinal cord, um, uh, sorry, the brain and the motor ne neurons. In addition to motor neurons, the spinal cord also contains a diverse array of spinal interneurons. So uh, most descending neurons do not directly contact motor neurons. And instead, they directly talk to these different kinds of spinal interneurons. And these spinal neurons, interneurons, in turn talk to motor neurons to bring about things like left-right coordination, hand-like coordination, coordination of joints within the same limb, et cetera. So overall, descending neurons can indirectly recruit many different combinations of motor neurons to bring about a wide variety of movements. And so in a sense, when it comes to voluntary control, all the calculations that happen in the brain are pretty much geared towards figuring out which segment of the spinal cord or which cell types of the spinal cord to activate. And as you can imagine, a loss of descending input from the brain to the spinal cord can be quite devastating, as in the case of patients with spinal cord injury um, who lose voluntary control below the site of injury. And so I'm pretty sure you'll agree that uh, in order to be able to figure out how movements are orchestrated by the nervous system, we need to know the organizational logic of the spinal cord and its connections with the brain. And so that's one of the main questions that I tried to address in my work. So what do we know about descending inputs to the spinal cord? So we do know that well-established uh, areas, the well-established uh, descending inputs come from important motor areas like the cortex, the red nucleus, the vestibular nucleus, and so on. 
But then there are all of these other descending pathways that are still debated. And they're still debated possibly because a lot of these um, supraspinal areas uh, were first described using very laborious techniques that were so inherently variable that they could not be easily reproduced from lab to lab. And so there was a lot of debate on whether some of these areas that I've mentioned even directly talk to the spinal cord or not. So here, I wanted to take advantage of some of the recent advances in viral tracing techniques to comprehensively map pre-spinal neurons or these descending neurons. And so to do this, I used the well-established uh, AAV retrovirus. So it's a capsid variant of the regular AAV2, which is normally um, used to, uh, in neuronal tracing and neuronal manipulations. And this virus, um, instead of infecting the cell body and then going to the uh, axons, uh, it, what it does is it infects the axon terminals and then gets transported to the cell body. So here to label supraspinal neurons or these descending neurons, I injected an AV retro expressing a Cre recombinase in either the cervical, thoracic, or lumbar regions of an adult uh, TD tomato reporter mouse. And as expected, when I looked in the brain, I found retro-labeled neurons in all the right places, the motor cortex, the red nucleus, um, the vestibular nucleus, and the reticular formation. And all this was good and expected. But there was one part of the brain that I had worked on as a grad student and was quite eager to look at uh, under the microscope, and that is the cerebellum. So quite interestingly, when I looked within the deep cerebellar nuclei, which are the main output neurons of the cerebellum, I noticed neurons retrolabeled not only from the cervical segments that control the hands and neck, but also from the thoracic segment that control the uh, trunk and the lumbar segments that control the legs. And this to me suggested that the cerebellum communicates directly with all major segments of the spinal cord. And I remember being really surprised because the cerebellum is not an area that's thought to directly communicate with the spinal cord. And so here I wanted to digress a little bit and tell you a little bit more about why I found this surprising. So first of all, the cerebellum takes pride of place when it comes to motor coordination. So without a cerebellum, you can still move, but you can't coordinate your movements. So that's because throughout your life, your cerebellum has been spying on you. It's been building this database of the relationship between sensory feedback and motor commands. And then it uses this database to learn and predict errors in movement and issue motor corrections. And given that movements happen so quickly, almost on the order of milliseconds, it's quite reasonable to think that the cerebellum should have direct access to spinal circuits, but that's not what's thought to be. If you look at any textbook, you'll see only indirect connections from the cerebellum to the spinal cord. But if you go beyond textbooks, over the last century, there have been quite a few uh, or a few dozen reports of direct connections from the cerebellum to the spinal cord, even described across a few species. But then there was a lot of debate around the existence of these cerebellar spinal neurons um, because of the techniques that were initially used to describe them, which is probably the reason why it never made it to the textbooks, not then, not now. And because of this debated existence of these cerebellar spinal um, neurons, there are two problems. One is very little is known about these neurons. And on the other hand, um, there's very few studies of motor control that take into account what could be a potentially important pathway in explaining how the nervous system orchestrates movements. And so in my work, I wanted to establish a contemporary framework for studying uh, the cerebellar spinal neurons and define their organization and function. And so one of the first things that I set out to do uh, was to find where within these nuclei, the deep cerebellar nuclei, the cerebellar spinal neurons were distributed. Uh, and that's because the deep cerebellar nuclei are anatomically and functionally diverse. And so overall, there's a medial uh, vestigial nucleus, the anterior and posterior intercostitis, which are important for limb control, and a lateral dentate nucleus. So first, to define the organization of pre-cervical and pre-lumbar neurons, I used a dual labeling strategy. So basically, I injected an AV retro expressing nuclear localized GFP in the cervical region. And then uh, injected another one expressing m cherry, which is a different fluorescent uh, protein, in the lumbar region. And I injected it such that only one half of the spinal cord was labeled. So then when I looked at the cerebellum, contralaterally for the most part, uh, contralaterally in the sense when uh, opposite to the side that I injected the spinal cord, contralaterally for the most part, I found only pre-cervical neurons in the posterior interpositus and the posterior nuclei. And uh, so the ones that are important for uh, 
balance. And these constitute a small minority of neurons in these nuclei, almost less than 10%. Now, on the other hand, ipsilaterally, I found free cervical neurons in the posterior interpositus and both pre cervical and pre lumbar neurons in the anterior interpositus. And these were anatomically segregated, hinting at some sort of somatotopy. So in fact, um, if you look at the um, anterior interpositus, it's been well established that the lateral part of this nucleus, uh, which is labeled in, which is empty and labeled in uh, yellow here, uh, is actually important for eye blink conditioning. So our data definitely bolsters evidence for somatotopy in this nucleus and um, kind of raises the possibility that neurons in different parts of this nucleus might be involved in um, controlling different parts of the body. So uh, just to summarize this, uh, the spinal cord receives excitatory inputs from the cerebellum and based on the laterality and target segments, um, I roughly classified these cerebellar spinal neurons into three groups. And um, then I wanted to know the function of these neurons. And so first I focused on these ipsilateral neurons. So several studies have previously shown that interpositus neurons are associated with limb control, especially the full limb. And so here, since I'd noticed a specific population of these neurons in the anterior interpositus, uh, specifically project to the cervical cord that controls the four limbs, I wanted to silence only this group of neurons and find out if um, these neurons are indeed important for four limb control. So to specifically silence ipsilateral pre-cervical cerebellar spinal neurons, I used a three-part intersectional strategy. So first, um, I injected an AV retro expressing CRE in one half of the cervical cord. Second, I injected a regular AV that expresses a CRE-dependent uh, muscarinic receptor in the ipsilateral deep cerebellar nuclei. Since HM4DI is a mutant muscarinic receptor, uh, it, it can basically hyperpolarize neurons when activated by um, an exogenous ligand, uh, clozapine anoxide, CNO. So third, I gave these uh, mice CNO intraperitoneally and tested them on a single pellet retrieval task to test um, full limb control. Excuse me. So in this task, uh, in the single pellet retrieval task, mice are food restricted and trained to reach the arms out of a box and grasp for a food pellet. So they're usually given 20 to 40 trials a day and each trial is scored either as a success or a failure. So for example, this would be a successful trial and this would be a failed trial. This would be a common mode of failure. So over nine days of training, the controls got better and better and showed a steady increase in the percentage of successful trials, uh, retrievals, but mice that had been receiving CNO during this training period, so technically mice that uh, whose um, ipsilateral cerebellar spinal neurons had been um, silenced, were not as good as the controls. And interestingly, I found a drop in performance even if the mice received CNO only after the task had been learned, suggesting that this small group of ipsilateral cerebellar spinal neurons is important for refining folium movement on the go. Now, on the other hand, um, contralateral cerebellar spinal neurons are enriched in um, the posterior interpositus and the vestigial nuclei, and damage to these nuclei can cause postural instability and ataxia. So quite naively, we thought silencing these contralateral cerebellar spinal neurons might cause ataxia, but that wasn't really the case. Uh, so basic locomotor patterns seemed okay in these mice. We did, um, we analyzed the gait, uh, we put them uh, on a beam balance, uh, open field, uh, and we didn't find any deficits. So then uh, we thought of challenging these mice on a little bit more, uh, a bit more difficult uh, rotor rod task. So in these tasks, uh, in the rotor rod task, Mice need to coordinate the activity of all four limbs and the trunk and uh, maintain the balance as they stay on an accelerating rod without falling down. So it's, it's quite a bit for the mice. So here the saline treated mice learned to stay on the rod for longer and longer uh, with uh, training. But then mice that had been receiving CNO during the training period were not as good as the controls. Now, if you think of the cerebellum, it does two things. So one is it's constant refining your movements as you move but it's also important for learning over longer periods of time so like for example when you're learning how to ride a bike so one of the questions that this data raised is are these neurons required both for learning and executing a task or is it actually dispensable once the task is already learned so we tested this 
and found that silencing these neurons on day four, uh, once the task had already been learned, did not affect motor performance. So this suggests that these neurons are critical for learning, but that's not possibly where the memory is stored. So um, overall, our data shows that these contralateral cerebellospinal neurons are essential for learning uh, complex lo locomotor tasks. And since I knew that these nuclei had direct access to the spinal cord, I wanted to know what its spinal targets were. And so to do this, I labeled the synaptic terminals of these contralateral cerebellospinal neurons with um, uh, EGFP, uh, a green fluorescent protein, using a similar intersectional strategy, except uh, instead of uh, Cree locks, I used FLIP and FRT. And I found that these uh, cerebellospinal neurons, whose axon terminals are uh, shown in white here, terminate mostly in lamina 8 and a little bit in lamina 7 of the spinal cord. And uh, what's special about these lamina, uh, lamina is that they're pretty much hotspot for premotor neurons or motor ne or, and premotor neurons are spinal interneurons that have direct access to uh, motor neurons and shape them outward. So compared to the other known descending pathways, the cerebellospinal neurons have the unique pattern of termination. They don't uh, resemble the termination pattern of uh, in, in its entirety. They don't resemble the termination patterns of um, uh, the other pathways, suggesting that they might be doing uh, something different from what the other pathways are doing. And uh, so next, I wanted to identify the target cell types. So first, I focused on um, premotor neurons of the engraved one lineage. So Engraved one neurons are a large group of inhibitory neurons in the spinal cord, and these account for almost half the inhibitory input onto motor neurons. And so, um, uh, and these are thought to be important to control. Uh, these engraved neurons are known to control locomotor speed by regulating the burst duration of uh, motor neurons. So, to test if uh, cerebellospinal neurons directly contact engraved one neurons. I label the, term, the synaptic terminals of contralateral cerebellospinal neurons in an engraved one reporter mouse. So you can see engraved one neurons labeled in red here and the terminals of uh, cerebellospinal neurons labeled in green. And I basically found that almost 30% of engraved one neurons in lamina H receive input from these contralateral cerebellospinal neurons. Now at the cervical levels, these engraved one neurons would be tasked with uh, controlling the activity of the forelimb and the neck muscles. But then what really surprised us about the rotor rod phenotype is that silencing um, these neurons seem to affect the ability of these mice to perform on a task that requires whole body coordination, despite only projecting to the cervical region. So this suggested that these neurons may be targeting neurons involved in uh, spinal neurons involved in interlimb coordination. So for example, neurons that are involved in, um, in coordinating forelimb hind limb movement, the hands and the legs. And so we turned our attention to these long descending proprio-spinal neurons. So these are a very small but specialized group of intersegmental neurons in the cervical cord. They have the soma in the cervical region, but then they can send axons all the way to the thoracic and lumbar segments which would allow these uh, proprio-spinal neurons to coordinate the activity of multiple motor segments. So to test if these descending, uh, long descending proprio-spinal neurons are indeed targeted by cerebellospinal neurons, I first label the, um, these uh, long descending proprio-spinal neurons by injecting the lumbar region of an AI-14 reporter mouse with an AV3. Um, so you have these neurons in the cervical, the long descending proprio-spinal neurons labeled in red. And then I label the synaptic terminals of cerebellospinal neurons as usual in um, green and uh, found that approximately little less than half of uh, the long descending propiospinal neurons receive synaptic inputs from these contralateral cerebellospinal neurons. And so here um, I wanted to mention that lamina 8 is also home to commissural neurons, which are necessary for left-right coordination. Um, and our preliminary data basically suggests that um, even the commissural neurons receive input from the cerebellospinal neurons. And so overall, um, cerebellospinal neurons have, di have uh, direct access to distinct spinal cell types, uh, which might be recruited in parallel to bring about the coordination of uh, multiple motor segments and thus um, the different limbs. So um, I'm just gonna skip this for the sake of time. Um, Sorry. Okay, so now, of course, the picture wouldn't be complete without um, 
knowing what the brain targets of these neurons are because descending neurons do not just send inputs to the spinal cord, but they also talk to different uh, parts of the brain. Uh, and usually uh, they talk to other motor areas. So I looked at the uh, brain and found that most targets of these uh, cerebellospinal neurons are important motor areas. The thalamus, which is known to project to the motor cortex, the red nucleus, areas in the pontine reticular formation, um, which is in the brainstem, and the lateral vestibular nucleus, which is important for balance, and the medullary reticular formation, which is also uh, part of the brainstem. And so what's interesting about these motor areas is that these um, motor areas are also major sources of descending inputs to the cervical cord shown here in, uh, and they're shown here in red. So overall, uh, cerebellospinal neurons maintain direct control over both these descending neurons and also different classes of spinal neurons. So in the future, it would be interesting to test the functional significance of each of these pathways because some of these um, uh, pathways could just be internal copies, uh, it could be sending information on internal copies, and some of these could actually be relaying motor commands. So one speculation is that um, the cerebellospinal neurons might be involved in um, timing the activity of, of all of its targets, including that of, uh, including, uh, that of the spinal neurons. And uh, one other que interesting question that we are interested in answering uh, is to determine if the cerebellospinal neurons um, also receive feedback from the same regions that they control. So if so, this would provide um, you know, valuable insights into how the cerebellum defines movements as we move. And so overall, to summarize, um, excitatory neurons in the interpositus and vestigial nuclei target distinct segments or distinct halves of the spinal cord. The ones that target the cervical, uh, the ipsilateral cervical cord are important for full limb control. The ones that target the contralateral cord are important for uh, learning of complex locomotor tasks. And in addition to maintaining direct control over descending neurons in the brain, um, uh, these neurons also target uh, spinal neurons that are essential for intersegmental and segmental control. So hopefully today I've convinced you that in addition to the four main descending pathways, there's a fifth descending pathway for motor control. And uh, with that, I would like to thank um, everybody who made this work possible. So first of all, my uh, mentor, Ariel, who's been an ideal sounding board. Um, Courtney uh, perfected uh, most of these cervical injections and set up the behavior assays. Kaya helped with uh, the data analysis and uh, our collaborators in the Chesler and O'Donovan labs um, at the NIH. And once again, thank you. Um, thanks to Bioswatch India uh, you know, for inviting me and, and for all you do. Uh, and thank you all for listening. Hey, uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Anupama, for this fantastic talk and shedding new lights on the cerebrospinal motor circuits. Uh, we have a few questions from the audience that we would like to pose to you. So, Eshwarya Segu is asking, why would you see the sudden decrease in success trials in the control mice receiving CNO after training when CNO activation took at least two days in experimental mice? So, CNO takes... Um usually acts within 30 minutes. It doesn't take two days. So within 30 minutes, you should be of injecting CNO, you should be uh, able to silence into neurons. I mean, silence uh, the neurons that express HM40I. All right, uh, okay. we have, yeah, another question from Venkat Ramaswamy. So he's asking if all cerebrospinal neurons are inhibited. Are what? If all cerebrospinal neurons are inhibitory? No, the cerebellospinal neurons are excitatory. They express uh, glutamate. I didn't show that data, but they're 99% uh, they are excitatory. They synapse onto inhibitory neurons, and um, not all of uh, its targets are inhibitory, though. They also synapse onto excitatory neurons, uh, like the long descending spinal neurons and uh, some of the commissural neurons. Um, we still haven't identified all the targets, but uh, a good chunk of them are excited to be. Uh, he actually has uh, another kind of follow-up question uh, that recently cerebellum has been shown to be indis indispensable for maintaining short-term memory in certain tasks. So if some of the effects that you're seeing are due to that uh, rather than the motor control view. 
So that could be possible. Um, right now, we don't know exactly what component of the task is affected by, um, you know, when we silence these neurons. Um, it could be important for, you know, the learning or the consolidation of memory. Um, so unless we, so we, yeah, so we cannot exclude that right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, there is a question from Narendra Ramnani. He asks whether the thalamic neurons identified within the so-called, uh, the neurons that are identified in the thalamus are located within the motor thalamus. Yes, so it's in the ventral, uh, uh, ventral uh, posterior and lateral thalamus, which are known to project to the motor cortex, the VPL and the VPL. Yeah. Okay. And seems like those are all the questions. Let me see if we are missing any other question. Okay, so there is a question by Orna Ghosh. Uh, the CS seems to influence spinal function directly and indirectly. Are these functionally uh, redundant? Uh, no, so I don't think they are functionally, I mean, first of all, I don't know the, um, we haven't tested it directly, so I can't, you know, say no. Uh, but the reason I think they're not redundant is basically um, because of the fact that when these neurons, um, when a spinal neurons receives input from um, different classes of descending neurons, um, it matters what combination of descending neurons it's listening to. So it's, it could mean something different if cerebellospinal neurons and vestibular spinal neurons are talking to one neuron versus, uh, you know, when a neuron is just receiving input from cerebellospinal neurons. Um, so we don't yet understand the complexities of how um, information is integrated within the spinal cord, especially by these ventral neurons that are targeted by descending pathways. And so, uh, yeah, so that's pretty, we don't exactly know the answer to that question yet. Okay. Uh, thank you. And I think we will just take uh, one last question. This is again a question from Ashwarya Sagu, which is a follow up to the answer that you have given. So she is saying that in your graphs, it looked like the decrease in success rates were after two days. Oh, no, it wasn't after two days. There was just a break in the graph. Um, so it's we give the, the decrease in success. Oh, that's because we start giving them CNO on the third day. So it was not after two days. That was the first day that they received um, CNO. So that was when they got silenced the first time. So Okay, so with uh, that, uh, we would end uh, this talk. Thanks a lot once again, Dr. Anupama, for the wonderful talk. In addition to these terms of questions, you have lots of compliments in the chat box that you can see uh, after this talk. And okay. now we would like to invite the third speaker of the day, Please extend a warm welcome to Dr. Nisha Kannan. She is an assistant professor at Isar Tiruvannanthapuram, where she runs the chronobiology lab. She and her team works on understanding the circadian clock at the genetic and neuronal network level. And she looks at how the behavior, physiology, and metabolism of an organism are rhythmically regulated. She is a Wellcome Trust DPT India Alliance Early Career Fellow and also an executive member of the Indian Society of Chronobiologists. And we welcome Dr. Nisha Kannan. Thank you, Poonam. Thanks for the introduction. I would like to thank Sruti and Vaishnavi for inviting me to speak here today. Uh, can all of you see my slides? Yes, Nisha, we can see. Okay. And the computer cursor is visible. Can you see the cursor? Uh, yes. Can you move it a little? Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Okay. Thanks, Puna. Yeah. Uh, this is a great initiative and I'm honored to be a part of this community. What I would like to do today is to tell you briefly about some of the recent findings from the ongoing projects in my laboratory. Studies in my lab is focused towards understanding the circadian clock at the genetic, molecular, and neuronal network level and how the circadian clock rhythmically regulates the behavior, physiology, and metabolism of an organism. To this end, we use Drosophila as a model organism. 
In most of the organism, behavior, physiology, and metabolism is rhythmic because we do live in a planet, in a rhythmic planet, where light dark cycle is going on relentlessly for around 3.5 billion years since the life evolved on Earth. This external light dark cycle imposed tremendous pressure on the organism to come up with an endogenous timekeeping system so that the organism can anticipate when it is going to be lights on and when it is going to be lights off so that it can schedule the activity at the most appropriate time of the day to enhance the survival. The adaptive fitness of the circadian timing system is not only restricted to the activity rasrutu, it also percolates into various behavioral, physiological, and metabolic processes, indicating the importance of circadian timing system. To tell you briefly about the fundamental properties of the circadian clock, I have shown here the locomotor activity rasrutu in Drosophila. Drosophila exhibits bimodal pattern of activity under 12-hour light, 12-hour dark cycles in the laboratory condition. Drosophila exhibits enhanced morning peak of activity that coincides with light zones at the time zero. It also exhibits an evening peak of activity that coincides with side giver time 12 lights off. The panel at the bottom shows the actogram, graphical representation of activity of a single fly recorded over eight consecutive days under like that cycle. A single fly, the, the graph is double plotted here and the fly exhibits morning peak of activity that synchronizes with light zone to attain a stable phase relationship through the process termed entrainment. Whereas when we transfer the organism into constant condition under constant darkness, henceforth referred as DD, the organism exhibits its endogenous clock periodicity. For example, some organisms, they phase advances their day-to-day -day onset of activity, resulting in a shorter free running periodicity, less than 24 hours. Whereas some organisms, they phase advances their day-to-day -day onset of activity, resulting in a longer free running periodicity greater than 24 hours. Entrainment and free running periodicity are the fundamental essential properties of the circadian clock. If we transfer the organism into constant light, constant light drives behavioral arrhythmicity as shown here in the bottom panel. Studies conducted during 1970s identified the first clock gene, period in Drosophila, that regulates behavioral rhythm. Loss of function of period gene leads to behavioral arrhythmicity in Drosophila. Subsequent sequential studies decoded the molecular machinery of circadian clock, and the molecular machinery of the circadian clock is currently understood as a transcriptional translational feedback loop consisting of the core clock genes, such as, such as period, timeless, clock, and cycle. During the early night, the transcriptional activators clock and cycle activates the transcription of period and timeless, the product proteins accumulates in the cytoplasm during the night. It forms a heterodimer and it shuttles back to the nucleus to inhibit its own transcription during the dawn. This transcriptional translational feedback loop generates 24-hour rhythmicity in the oscillation of the product proteins as shown here in the bottom panel. Period and timeless oscillates with a peak during the dark phase under light dark cycle that is antiphasic to the oscillation of clock protein. This rhythmicity in the clock protein oscillation drives rhythm in various behavior, physiology, and metabolic processes. Based on the expression of these proteins, clock proteins, approximately 150 clock neurons are identified in the fly brain. Based on the anatomical location, they are subgrouped into dorsal, ventral, and lateral neurons in the fly brain. These 150 neurons constitutes the circadian pacemaker or the central clock in Drosophila. In humans, the central clock is located at the base of the hypothalamus termed as suprachiasmatic nucleus. The 
clock protein expression is not only restricted to the suprachiasmatic nucleus present in the brain it is also present in multiple tissues and organs throughout the body including the metabolically active tissues such as liver gut pancreas and so on the synchrony between the central clock present in the brain and other peripheral clock is important to achieve coordination between behavior physiology and metabolism of an organism forced desynchronization of the circadian clock for example in the case of shift workers desynchronization of the central clock from the peripheral clock leads to or it leads to increase the incidence of sleep disorders or it increases the incidence of metabolic disorders such as obesity diabetes and so on indicating the importance of circadian clock in metabolism Although studies indicates the importance of circadian clock in metabolism, the underlying pathways through which circadian clock regulates metabolism is not really well understood. Hence, in the present study, we are interested to understand the precise role of circadian clock, the underlying pathways through which circadian clock regulates metabolism in Drosophila. In Drosophila, the expression of clock protein is not only restricted to the brain, it is present in multiple tissues and organs in the body, including the metabolically active tissues such as fat body and gut. Fat body is functionally analogous to the mammalian pancreas, mammalian liver and adipose tissue. Studies already showed that circadian clock proteins are expressed in the fat body but its functional relevance is not yet understood hence in the present study we are interested to understand the role of central and peripheral circadian clocks in regulating the behavior and metabolism apart from that we are also interested to understand the role of specific clock genes in regulating the behavior and metabolism in this particular study we have used various clock mutants such as per null, gym null, clock jerk, and cycle null. These mutants are arrhythmic under constant darkness because their molecular clock machinery is disrupted as a result of this mutation. To, under, to address the role of circadian clock in triglyceride metabolism, we have used various clock mutants such as uh, clock jerk, gym null, cycle null, and per null. And we also used W118 as a control. By using these fly lines, we as we assessed the triglyceride levels in freshly emerged flies. We used freshly emerged flies because the triglyceride levels present in freshly emerged fly is mainly the larval energy storage. And we assessed the triglyceride level. The results showed that tim null flies, timeless null flies exhibit enhanced triglyceride level compared to other clock mutants and control. We also estimated the triglyceride level in five-day-old flies to assess the role of timeless in regulating the triglyceride level in an adult stage specific manner. The results showed that even in adult flies, timeless mutants exhibit enhanced triglyceride level compared to other clock mutants and controls, indicating that circadian clock plays an important role in regulating the triglyceride level in Drosophila. To confirm the role of time, timeless in regulating the triglyceride level, we used both heterozygous and homozygous timeless mutants. And we estimated the triglyceride level of both male and female flies. We used freshly emerged flies to assess the triglyceride level. And the results showed that in the case of male flies, both heterozygous and homozygous tim mutants possess enhanced triglyceride compared to the control, whereas female flies did not exhibit any significant difference in triglyceride level compared to the controls. In the case of five-day-old adult flies, we do see that homozygous timeless mutant, male flies exhibit an enhanced triglyceride level compared to the controls. This result confirms that timeless plays an important role in regulating the triglyceride level in male flies. Rest of the experiments were carried out only in male flies. As timnal mutants exhibited enhanced triglyceride level, we were interested to assess whether these flies exhibit enhanced starvation resistance. We assess the starvation resistance in both heterozygous and homozygous tim mutant and compared it with the control. The results showed that 
homozygous tim mutants exhibits enhanced starvation resistance compared to both heterozygous and controlled flies we also estimated the time taken for 50 percentage of the fly death under starvation condition the results showed that tim null flies exhibit an increase in the time taken for 50 percentage of fly death under starvation condition these results suggest that timeliness plays an important role in regulating the triglyceride metabolism and starvation resistance we were interested to understand timeliness expressed in which specific subset of neurons plays an important role in regulating the triglyceride metabolism for that we used a bipartite genetic tool in drosophila the uas gal4 system in which gal4 is fused with a tissue specific promoter and the uas is fused with the gene of interest or the rna i of the gene which we are interested in while crossing gal4 and uas lines in the progeny gal4 lines are expressed in a tissue specific manner gal4 binds to the upstream activation sequence or uas sequence and as a result the gene of interest is over expressed or the rna i is over expressed in a tissue specific manner in the pr present study we used a series of second chromosome specific gal4 lines that is specific to the circadian clock neuron here we have used tim gal4 that is specific to specific to the clock neurons as shown here in blue circles we also used another gal4 lines that is clock 9 and gal4 that is specific to the ventral and dorsal neurons in the brain by using these two gal4 lines we overexpressed timeless and we assessed the effect of timeless overexpressing in the clock neurons in the activity residual the upper panel shows the control control flies they do exhibit free running periodicity slightly greater than 24 hours as shown here whereas in the case of experimental fly lines over expressing timeliness in the clock neurons exhibited behavioral erythemicity under constant darkness indicating that timeliness expressed in the central clock neurons plays an important role in regulating the activity rest of the endosophila we we were also interested to understand what is the importance of this timeliness expressed in circadian clock neurons in triglyceride metabolism for that we used two gal4 lines as shown here this is tim gal4 this is clock 9 and gal4 and we assess the triglyceride level in both day 0 and day 5 old flies the results showed that in the case of flies over expressing timeliness under tim gal4 control they do exhibit reduced triglyceride level compared to control in both day 0 and day 5 old flies when we used clock 9 and gal4 to over express timeliness in the case of experimental flies we do see a reduction in triglyceride level compared to the control in both day 0 and day 5 old flies indicating that timeliness expressed in the central clock neuron plays an important role in regulating the triglyceride level we also tested whether these flies will exhibit any difference in the starvation resistance when we used tim gal4 to over express timeliness we do see that experimental flies are sensitive to starvation compared to the control flies similarly when we used clock 9 and gal4 experimental flies are sensitive to starvation compared to the control we also quantified the time taken for 50 percentage of fly death under starvation condition for both the experimental lines and we do see that there is a significant reduction in the time taken for 50 percentage of fly death in both the experimental lines now as i already mentioned clock gene expression is not only restricted to the brain it is also present in multiple tissues which is metabolically active fat body is an important metabolically active tissue we over express timeliness in the fat body by using two different gal4 ppl gal4 which is a weaker gal4 line and cg gal4 which is a stronger gal4 line and we assessed its impact on triglyceride metabolism the results are as follows when we used a weaker gal4 line 
and we assess the triglyceride level in both freshly immersed and five day old flies. The results showed that in the case of experimental line, there is a significant reduction in the triglyceride level in the case of both day zero and day five old flies. When we used a stronger Galfog line, even in that case, we do see a significant reduction in triglyceride level in the case of both day zero and day five old flies. We also assessed whether timeless overexpression in the fat body will have an impact on starvation resistance. When we used a weaker GAL4 line, we didn't see any significant difference in the starvation resistance between the control and experimental line. However, when we used a stronger GAL4 line, we do see that the experimental line, which is overexpressing timeless in the fat body, exhibits reduced starvation resistance compared to the control. Consistent with that, we do see a significant reduction in the time taken for the 50 percentage of the fly death under starvation condition. These results indicates that timeless expressed in the fat body plays an important role in regulating the triglyceride level and starvation resistance in Rosophila. In further studies, we were interested to understand how exactly timeless regulates the triglyceride metabolism. We focused our studies on a couple of uh, genes involved in triglyceride metabolism, and we narrowed down to a particular gene that is Brumer, which is a lipase, and it's a homologue of human adipocyte triglyceride lipase. Brumer plays an important role in mobilizing the triglyceride in Drosophila, and Brumer mutants are obese in nature. We assessed the triglyceride, we assessed the Brumer transcript level in Tim Null flies, which are freshly emerged and five day old. The results showed that Brumer transcript level is reduced in both freshly emerged and five day old flies. Hence, this result indicates that probably timeless is regulating the triglyceride level via Brumer but it is likely that timeless is regulating other metabolically relevant genes, which we are yet to understand and we are addressing that question now. Based on these results, let me summarize the findings of the, let me summarize the first half of my talk. The results of our studies showed that among the core clock genes, timeless plays an important role in regulating the triglyceride level in Drosophila, probably via Brumer and it, it leads to a starvation resistance phenotype as well. Apart from timeless, we also address the role of uh, photoreceptors in regulating the behavior and metabolism in Drosophila. We focused on a particular photoreceptor, cryptochrome. Cryptochrome plays an important role in perceiving the environmental light signal into the circadian clock present in the fly brain. Circadian photoreceptor cryptochrome is located deep inside the brain in the circadian clock neurons. Although studies showed that circadian photoreceptor cryptochrome is important in entrainment, their expression of uh, cryptochrome is not only restricted to the fly, fly brain, it is also present in multiple metabolically active tissues, including the fat body. The functional relevance of cryptochrome expressed in fat body is not yet addressed. Hence, in the present study, we used various fly lines such as uh, crinal, and uh, we have used various RNA islands, cry RNA islands. We used three different cry RNA islands to knock down the expression of cryptochrome in both the central clock and in the peripheral fat body clock to address the role of cryptochrome in behavior and metabolism. Following is the result we obtained when we used the crinal flies. We recorded the activity of both control and crinal flies under constant light. As we already mentioned in the beginning, constant light drives behavioral erythemicity in control flies. Whereas crinal flies, they do exhibit split rhythmicity under constant light with a long free running component and a shorter free running component as shown here. We were interested to understand what is the role of central clock and peripheral fat body clock in regulating this activity rest rhythm. For that, we used Tim Gal 4 line and we knocked down the expression of cryptochrome in all the clock neurons present in the fly brain. 
and we assessed its impact on activity restriction. The results showed that flies with reduced expression of cryptochrome in the clock neuron, central clock neuron, exhibits split rhythm with a longer free running component as shown here. And it has an additional feeble, shorter free running component as shown here, indicating that cryptochrome expressed in the central clock neuron plays an important role in regulating the activity rest rhythm in Drosophila. We also addressed what is the importance of cryptochrome expressed in the fat body in activity rest rhythm. We knocked down the expression of cryptogram in the fat body by using CGGAR4 and we assessed the activity rest rhythm. The results shows that flies in which cryptogram is reduced in the fat body, they are still arrhythmic in nature, more or less similar to that of the control flies shown here. Indicating that cryptogram expressed in the fat body is not really important in regulating the activity rest rhythm. We asked what is the possible role for this cryptogram expressed in the fat body. Fat body is metabolically active tissue, hence we speculated that it may regulate the metabolism in drosophila. That is what we addressed further. We used three different RNA eyeline, cry RNA eyeline, and we knocked down the expression of cryptogram in the fat body. And we assessed the triglyceride level in freshly emerged flies and compared it with the control. As you can see here, there is no significant difference in the triglyceride level between the three experimental line and the control in freshly emerged flies. We also assessed the starvation resistance in these flies. We didn't get any consistent difference in the starvation resistance among these three experimental lines and the control. And we don't see any significant difference in this time taken for 50% of fly death under starvation condition. Indicating that cryptochrome expressed in the fat body does not play any role in regulating the triglyceride level during the development prior to the emergence of the fly. We also assessed the triglyceride level in five-day-old flies, which will reflect the adult stage specific triglyceride level. As you can see here, when we reduced the expression of cryptochrome in the fat body by using three different RNA eyeline, in all the three lines, we do see a, an increase in the triglyceride level compared to the control. We also assess the starvation resistance in these three experimental lines in which the cryptochrome expression is reduced in the fat body. We do see that consistently in all these three experimental lines, there is an enhanced starvation resistance compared to the control. When we quantified the time taken for the 50% of the fly death, in all the three experimental lines, there is a significant increase in the time taken for the 50% of the fly death under starvation condition, indicating that cryptochrome expressed in the fat body plays an important role in regulating the triglyceride level in an adult stage specific manner, not during the development. We also asked what is the importance of cryptochrome expressed in the central clock present in the brain in regulating the triglyceride level. We estimated the, five, the triglyceride level in five day old flies and we didn't see any consistent significant difference in the triglyceride level between the experimental lines and the controls. We also assess the starvation resistance. We didn't see any consistent difference in the starvation resistance. We didn't find any significant difference in the time taken for 50% of fly death under starvation condition. Indicating that the cryptogram expressed in the central clock neurons does not play any significant role in regulating the triglyceride metabolism and starvation resistance in adult flies. Based on this, let me summarize the second half of my talk. The results of our study showed that cryptochrome, the circadian photoreceptor present in Drosophila, regulates the triglyceride level and starvation resistance in an adult stage specific manner. Based on this, let me summarize the major findings of the study. Timeless expressed in the central clock in the brain regulates both the activity rest rhythm and triglyceride level in drosophila. 
Timeless expressed in the fat body regulates only the triglyceride level. It does not play an important role in regulating the activity rest rhythm. In Drosophila, timeless is probably regulating the lipase bromer and thus it regulates the triglyceride metabolism in Drosophila. Circadian photoreceptor cryptochrome expressed in the central graph regulates the activity rest rhythm. It does not play a significant role in regulating the triglyceride level. Cryptochrome expressed in the fat body regulates the triglyceride level in an adult stage specific manner. With this, I would like to stop here. Before that, let me discuss the future direction of this project. In this project, we are interested to understand the role of food as a side keeper. For instance, light is being perceived by the central clock present in the brain and light entrains the central clock. It further synchronizes the peripheral clock. Whereas the peripheral clock present in the metabolically active tissues, they consider food as the time queue. The, timing, the time information is received via food and the peripheral clock send feedback signals to the central clock. However, the precise nature of the signal, the precise signals through which the peripheral clock convey the feedback signal to central clock is not really well understood. Hence, the overall objective of this project is to obtain a comprehensive understanding on the crosstalk between central clock or the circadian clock and metabolism and how it enable an organism to achieve synchrony between behavior, physiology and metabolism. With this, I would like to stop here. And uh, I would like to thank my students, PhD students, major minor project students, my collaborators, those who provided the transgenic climbs and antibodies. I would also like to thank Isar Trivendra and the Welcome Trust DBT India Alliance for the funding. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Nisha, for this uh, fantastic talk on the regulation of uh, by molecular clocks in brain and tissue control activity rest rhythms in the fruit flies. Uh, I would just like to mention that uh, Dr. Nisha's talk was uh, representing the systems and computation neuro field, uh, neuroscience field today. And uh, now let's uh, get started with a few questions that we have received from the audience. Uh, Megha is asking, uh, does the circadian clock not control protein metabolism as well? Megha, that's a good question, but none of the studies so far addressed whether circadian clock regulates the protein metabolism. We don't have any empirical evidence on that. Okay. Uh, next question is from Abhishek. He's asking how exactly does obesity show up in the specifically obese fruit fly mutants that you used? And is this specific to fat body area or is it a whole body presentation? Oh, we, we have used the whole body. We, we didn't do any assay specific to the fat body, but in future we are planning to extend the studies only to fat body. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Annapurna asks, how does the relationship between circadian clock and fat metabolism uh, translate to humans? So what are the implications of this on the lifestyle disorders that we see so rampantly? Yes, as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, if, uh, if we desynchronize the central clock and peripheral clock in the case of humans, for example, in the case of shift workers, they are more prone to metabolic disorders. Uh, th there is more chance for the incidence of uh, obesity, diabetes. Uh, it's not only restricted the metabolic disorders, it can even affect the cognition and uh, hence, uh, misalignment of the circadian clock from the external like that cycle can have severe impact even in humans. Right, so uh, there is actually a linked or follow-up kind of question about this from Chainika Biswas. So she says, can we think of ways to reduce this constant occupation problem in shift workers that is related to these circadian dysregulations? Uh -huh. The only, only solution is that we can provide them, we can provide them 
like that cycle, but still, I would say the best solution is not to not to desynchronize your clock. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't think uh, we can provide a solid solution for the shift workers. It's better that you sleep when your clock is instructing you to sleep. That is the best solution. Yeah. Yes, so uh, maybe I'll take one uh, last question, although there are more in, but in interest of time, I'm just going to take one last question. So we have one from Ornab Ghosh. He says, uh, apart from Brahmar, are other lipases also involved? SXE2, for example. Yeah, SXE2 is in our list of genes that we have considered. We are yet to address whether SXE2 plays any role in regulating the clock mediated metabolism. Maybe in future we can answer that question. Yeah. Okay, then uh, once again, uh, thanks a lot to you, Dr. Nisha for accepting our invitation to talk in this conference. And uh, now it's time for the fourth invited speaker of the day. Uh, so uh, let's extend a very, very warm welcome to Dr. Mallika Chatterjee. She is an assistant professor and chief coordinator of Neurospine Cluster at MIT Institute of Neuropsychology and Neurosciences in Noida. She works on molecular and genetics aspect of neuronal development. She is a recipient of Welcome Press DPT India Alliance Early Career Fellowship as well. Uh, and she has also won uh, the Ibro Dana Brain Awareness Week uh, Grant Award last year for increasing the neuroscience outreach. Today, she is going to represent the neuronal development field and her talk will focus on molecular signals that help neurons to make functionally important connections between the thalamic and cortical brain regions in mice. Dr. Malika, thanks a lot for accepting our, our invitation to talk here and the stage is all yours. Uh, thank you so much, Poonam, for the kind introduction. And a big shout out to Shruti and Vaishnavi for this unique concept of, you know, showcasing neuroscientists, women, you know, in this uh, showcasing our work in this field and promoting that so that we are not, people are not biased in choosing us for our, for their conference presentations and, you know, incorporating us in their work. Okay. So today I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, a very interesting molecule that I came across during my PhD tenure. And uh, one second, yeah. So, and what I was doing was I was looking into the function of a particular molecule called uh, GBX2. And in the context of that work, I was looking into the thalamus, which is a key area or a key sensory, which acts as a sensory relay station. So, uh, and what about it? So I'm going to tell you the story of the heparin sulfate and its modifications and its subsequent role in determining axonal trajectories. So what you see here is the sagittal section of the mouse forebrain at embryonic day E16 and half. Shown in green here is the sensory relay station that I was talking about. And in previous speakers have also elucidated to this point, to this structure and what you see here is in green is the thalamus. It basically receives information from the periphery and sends it up towards the cortex. There are well other areas adjacent to the thalamus, which are also functionally important, like the epithalamus and the prethalamus, which we'll come across during the context of my other slides. Well, I was telling you about GBX2. GBX2 is a transcriptional factor, which is expressed in the post-mitotic cells of the early developing thalamus. In my PhD lab, we had a transgenic line in which GFP was expressed as a reporter under the GBX2 promoter. An example of how that uh, GBX2, which was here tagged with the GFP, you know, and therefore traced with the help of a GFP antibody can be seen here, you know, in the developing uh, mouse thalamus. And this is a coronal section at embryonic day E12 and half. And as you see, the green cells here represent GBX2 expressing cells in the developing thalamus. So what happens when you do not have GBX2? Well, in the GBX2 null mice, we saw a multitude of thalamocortical defects. This is the section and a magnified section of the mouse brain, 
showing the thalamus at E14 and half. And here you see the entire thalamus is marked green, which, is, which means that these cells are from the GBH2 lineage. This is the control which shows nice projections. And these are thalamocortical projections, which will go up to the cortex eventually. However, in the GBX2 mutant, we see a lot of these projections were misrouted to the dorsal side, which is the habenula, which is a part of the epithalamic domain. When we do look at a higher magnification picture also, instead of going straight to the structure of the internal capsule, you know, which is like a pathway or a highway, as I call it, through which thalamocortical projections travel, there was an intense cro uh, aberrant crossing over, you know, and uh, like a zigzag pattern almost, and there was a loss in the organization of the thalamocortical neurons. Again, looking into the cortex and into the cortical plate, what we saw as compared to the control, there were a lot of aberrant projections reaching straight up to the pile surface. Mind you, this is the null mutant. In the other type of mutant, what we did was we generated a conditional knockout where we knocked out GBX2 at the developmental stage in mice of embryonic E13 and half. And at E15 and half, we analyzed control and mutant conditionals. And this is what we saw, that in a normal scenario, this is the ventral side of the diencephalon, where almost you see very little uh, projections of thalamocortical uh, projections going down. Instead, in the mutant, there, were, uh, there was a thick bundle of thalamic origin cells, which seemed to actually reach out to the ventral side. And later on, we have also shown that they cross the hypothalamic midline. So this is a schematic of the summary of the GBX2 mutant phenotypes. In the wild type, the green thalamocortical projections are nicely going up to the cortex and a stray axon or two is going to the pile surface. But however, in the mutant, what is happening is not only are there fewer axons going up, uh, axons are also, you know, projections are going towards the pile surface aberrantly. There is a lot of aberrant dis or misorganization of the internal capsule region. And there was a lot of ventral uh, targeting in uh, conditional knockout mutants also. And clearly shown in later stages at embryonic 16 and a half was that in, like the, unlike the control where nice bunch of uh, thalamocortical projections were seen in the neocortex, we weren't practically seeing any projections. In contrast, there was this thick bundle of projections which was traveling up towards dorsally, towards the epithalamus. Now, what we found through our literature survey was uh, GBX2 mutant phenotypes, the axonal phenotypes that I just uh, described to you, somewhat phenocopied a class of mutants called robomutants. Well, all of you must be knowing, since you're all neuroscientists here, that axonal targeting requires a lot of, you know, a chemo attraction, chemo repulsion, uh, which involves ligands binding to receptors and so on. So Robo family is a very known, well-known and very well-classified reporters, uh, sorry, receptors, which binds to chemo repellent ligands called slits and helps in axonal navigation in the forebrain as in other regions of the CNS. What Lopez Bendito found out in 2007 by inserting a dye eye into the thalamic area is that like in the control, there was a nice group of thalamic projections going to the neocortex. However, in the robo one, robo two double mutant, what they found was, especially if you focus on this caudal region of the thalamic section, was there a lot of neurons actually made their way ventrally instead of going towards the neocortex. And this area is shown in a higher magnification here. And this is the summary of their uh, findings that a lot of these projections, instead of going up, actually travel downwards. This seemed to uh, phenocopy the mutation, uh, the phenotype that we found in our GBX2 mutant, which in which GBX2 had been knocked out at 13 and a half. So this was a conditional mutant, wherein we again, like this mutant, Robo1, Robo2, we saw ventral targeting. So one question or a very simple question we had in our mind 
is robo1 robo2 expression down regulated in absence of gbx2 and because of that are we getting this aberrant uh, ventral uh, you know targeting and since gbx2 is a transcription factor it is not a too much far fetched idea to think that it might be actually directly or indirectly transcriptionally regulating robo1 robo2 expression so in the old fashioned manner we first did what is known as rna in situ hybridization to check the transcripts in sections of gbx2 mutant and what we found as compared to the control at e12 and half that there was significant expression of uh, robo2 in the control uh, thalamus whereas there was a almost complete down regulation of robo2 in the uh, mutant thalamus however unlike what we expected like we expected robo1 robo2 both to go down in expression in the gbx2 mutant but we didn't see that instead robo1 expression in the mutant thalamus as compared to the control was significantly up regulated and also this is a schematic showing that how robo as a receptor interacts with slit and this interaction is important for thalamocortical guidance through the internal capsule so the summary was we saw up regulation of robo1 in the gbx2 mutant and down regulation of robo2 in the same well you might ask me are the protein levels affected well yes they are similarly affected we did an immunostaining of adjacent sections and see while this is the control you know this is the control uh, thalamus which shows robo2 uh, antibody uh, staining whereas there was uh, sorry robo1 antibody staining whereas you see a consistent up regulation in the mantle zone however in the robo2 area where the mantle zone is very strongly positive for robo2 expression in the control it is down regulated in the mantle region with some remnants being there in the very uh, little bit ventral side in fact robo1 is also up regulated in the aberrant projections that we had noticed earlier in the gbx2 mutant so gbx2 is regulating expression of robo1 robo2 both transcripts and protein differentially in the developing thalamus by doing a, a few more other studies we finally published that by regulating uh, the expression of another transcription factor called lhx2 and by inhibiting another limb homeo domain transcription factor lhx9 gbx2 ends up uh, inducing robo2 or reducing robo1 in the control in the mutant what happens is lhx2 is down regulated lhx9 is up regulated as we have seen in our in situ and qpcr data robo2 as a result is down regulated and robo1 expressions are up regulated so the question was well robo1 expression is up regulated but how come the gbx2 mutant phenotype still Pino copies robo1 robo2 mutant is robo1 not uh, doing its function well at the time to answer that question we have come up with another hypothesis wherein we looked at this molecule called heparin sulfate proteoglycan which by binding to robo and slit has been traditionally shown to potentiate the binding of slit to robo and therefore potentiate its activity of the receptor uh binding to the ligand and subsequent chemorepulsion activity so we became interested in hspg now what are hspgs hspg is basically a carbohydrate uh, polymer made up of alternating uh, carbohydrate residues which may be either bound to a core protein and then bound to a membrane or a cell membrane or else they might be freely floating about in the extracellular matrix and interestingly they they have various alternating domains some of which are not sulfated that is the na domain here and some of which is called the s domain that is they are variously sulfated at specific points of the carbohydrate residues in the chain that is either at the 2 ortho position or at the 6 ortho position and as i will show you this sulfation becomes very important for the axon guidance eventually and hspg is made uh, extensively post translationally modified wherein uh, by the action of subsequent polymerase and n deacetylase and sulfotransferase epimerase and then finally ortho sulfotransferase enzyme activity wherein the final molecule which consists of these alternating unsulfated and sulfated domains are formed 
throughout the body it has been well established that hspgs have different functions you know multiple functions including binding to molecules and helping in conformational activation enhancing protein protein interaction acting as co receptor for ligands a famous case is fgf binding also they help to aggregate uh, intracellular uh, extracellular ligands in this case for uh, an example would be like slit so what we saw was in a, we had done a micro array of the gbx2 mutant uh, in the mouse brain at embryonic day e12 and half so when we compared it to, to the controls both our fpkm results and also the qpcr showed that of when we looked at all the enzymes which are involved in the hspg production pathway you know or the post translational modification pathway we saw three isoforms of the same enzyme that is heparin sulfate 6 sulfotransferase 1 2 and 3 all three isoforms of heparin sulfate 6 or sulfate sulfotransferase was all down regulated in the gbx2 mutant thalamus so was the expression of these uh, you know post translationally modified hspgs they are being uh, affected well we did an in situ and as i said we have done qpcr also and for st i have data here to show you the st1 and st2 are both down regulated in the mantle zone of the gbx2 mutant in fact we used an antibody called 10e4 which only stains for the unsulfated residue so if you have more of the unsulfated residues you will have higher level of staining and so that's what we exactly saw that in the wild type see this is a higher mag of the thalamic mantle zone where we saw towards the ventricles in the wild type the axons were labeled with 10e4 that is there is not much of sulfation obviously because you had more six ortho sulfated residues in the mutant in the control whereas in the mutant there seemed to be an increase in the overall intensity of the 10e4 staining and we have multiple ends to confirm uh, this data that there was indeed an enhancement of the 10e4 staining thus suggesting that the sulfation pattern of hspgs is altered in the thalamus in addition interestingly what we found that hspg in we now looked at the hs hs6st1 that is a sulfotransferase enzyme 1 to double knockouts to see what is the thalamic phenotype there you know and what we found was there was a loss in the cortical projections there are very few uh, thalamocortical projections reaching up to the cortex and in fact the cortex was even thinner which might be a proliferation defect non autonomous because hs6st2 is uh, being expressed here and so therefore what is the function we are still looking at the proliferation aspect or function of hspgs in the cortex so an interesting experiment that we did was uh, we took explant cultures of wild type which were labeled with rfp these are thalamic explant cultures and exposed them to cos7 cells in the first case these cos7 cells is like a co culture system the cos7 cells are expressing gfp in the second uh, scenario they are still the wild type cultures but the cos7 cells are expressing slit 1 which is one of the ligands you know of the robo receptors in the third and the fourth case the mute the cultures the red cultures are actually from the st1 to double knockouts and the uh, corresponding cos cells are expressing either gfp or slit what we saw was very interesting was that in while in the wild type when we measured what was the ratio of the proximal that is the neurites which were extended towards the cos cells and the distal that is neurites extended away from the cos cells when we calculated the ratio we saw that while in the uh, gfp uh, expressing cos cell con culture condition there was an almost equal number of neurons in uh, neurites in both the proximal as well as the distal uh, part of the culture in the st1 st2 double knockout condition yes the proximal in the the wild type situation as expected you know there was a depulsion so there was almost very little uh, neurites in the proximal zone however when you look into the mutant that is the st1 st2 double knockout we didn't get any significant repulsion of these thalamic neurites that is to say in absence of st1 and st2 enzymes these thalamic neurons seem to have lost their chemorepulsive activity 
And this is something which was also recapitulated in our GBX2 mutant thalamic axon phenotype when we did a similar experiment with slit 2. And eventually we have also done with the other slit ligand, that's slit 2 and slit 1. And I've shown the same that in absence of GBX2 or in absence of ST1, ST2, the uh, thalamic axons seem to lose their repulsive nature. But mind you, these thalamic axons still continue to express the receptors, that is robo, you know, and slit at normal levels. So that is shown here, that is robo expression as shown in the wild type is almost comparable to the uh, mutant. And robo one, this is shown in proximal rostral sections and caudal sections, and this is the mutant double knockout in the control and the in the proximal and the caudal section. And robo two again here in the control, you see the nicely uh, projecting axons, thalamocortical axons, but we see lack of axons. However, in the double mutant, however, the take home message from this slide is that robo expression is unaltered, but from the previous slide, we know that they lose their responsiveness to slit. And by in situ, because our slit antibody wasn't working at that time, at an earlier stage that is 12 and a half, we are able to show that in the thalamus, the slit uh, expression, slit one and two expression is unaltered. So we see a couple of other uh, phenotypes also, not only that the in the ST1, ST2 double knockout, the cortical axons are not reaching or the TC projections, thalamocortical projections are not reaching the cortex that is shown uh, in, a, in another section here. At the same time, the initially proje initial projections that come out from towards the prethalamus that as shown in a higher magnification here as compared to the control and the mutant when we did an estimation of the intensity, you know, this has been eight and this has been one and calculated the intensity of the GFP axons in the wild type versus the mutant, what we saw was as compared to the wild type, which is shown in red, where the intensity falls, you know, so there is very less intensity towards the lateral side of the thalamus. However, in the mutant, there seems to be an enhancement of the in progressive enhancement of the intensity of the GFP, that is to say, there are more GFP axons in the lateral side of the mutant as compared to the control. So there is a lateral shift of the ST1 uh, of the thalamocortical projections when they just exit the prethalamus in the ST1, ST2 double knockout. We uh, currently, you know, uh, here in Amity, we have started to do in collaboration with a few of my colleagues we have just started to do some uh, docking and simulation biophysical experiments to give us an idea of how this mutant complex of uh, heparin sulfate with and without the 6-orthosulfation in complex with slit and robo might be functioning. So as all docking and simulation experiments go, we had an initial atomic model. We calculated the molecular forces that were acting on each atom of this uh, partners of this complex. And they were moved in, a, you know, in the software according to those forces. And then we did a simulation to see what was their network style, you know, uh, pattern. So, of course, a biophysicist will be much better than me in uh, order to explain this. But I'll try to uh, try my best. So, all the type, different types of energy that are involved in forming, uh, these, you know, uh, the atom-atom interaction. These are as represented here, the energy subtypes, van der Waal energy, electrostatic, polar solvation, SASA, and binding energy in the control complex, that is slit, robo, and a uniformly sulfated heparin sulfate. These are their energy values. So for now, you have to uh, just ignore the minus signs and concentrate on the absolute values of these uh, of the numbers. And as you see in the mutant complex, that is when you have slit robo with a heparin sulfate devoid of any 6 orthosulfation, there is a significant decrease in all the, in the level or the energy levels. So there is certainly a loss in energy of interaction of the components in the mutant complex. Okay. And uh, subsequently, we have also done a simulation studies where the root mean square deviation and the RG has been calculated over a period of 500 nanoseconds. And this, uh, if you see the graph here, this basically shows the flexibility of the complex, you know, in the interaction in the medium. And the green is the slit robo plus wild type heparin sulfate. And the red is the slit robo 
plus heparin sulfate without any 6 orthosulfation. And what we saw, you can see there's a lot of red alone, you know. So that means that there is a lot of flexibility uh, and conformational flexibility in the mutant. So, but it is a less stable uh, conformation and which is also shown in the initial part of the RG when we calculate the radius of gyration. And therefore, the, again, the, there's a lot of red area which shows that in the initial part, the complex is unstable and then gradually it stabilizes over the 500 nanosecond of simulations. And finally, we see that the mutant complex covers a large area of conformational uh, space than in the control. That means this red is the large area in which we see that it basically the whole complex, the triad moves more than the one with the wild type. So these are some biophysical uh, data which sort of support, I wouldn't say I'm just presenting the biophysical data, it sort of supports and helps us to understand the what might be happening inside the cell to these, you know, something which I'm unable to do in the wild type. I'm sorry, in the wet lab. So the, uh, uh, the Conclusion from here is that the lack of 6 orthosulfation in HS moiety therefore causes the loss of stability, increased flexibility, and subsequently the loss of function of the protein glycoprotein triad. So, uh, just to uh, uh, summarize, we saw that loss of HS6ST1 to enzyme partially phenocopies the axonal guidance defects of the GBX2 mutant wherein a subpopulation of the thalamocortical axons are guided towards the hypothalamus. We also got a unique phenotype of ST12 DKO mutants where axons are reduced in number towards the cortex and axon bundles from the free thalamus. The initial projections are also shifted laterally. So uh, one thing we have also moved on is to sort of get an initial idea of how uh, they are functioning, you know, how is the genetic network. So earlier I had shown that GBX2 uh, is uh, controlling the robo-1, inhibiting robo-1 expression, inducing robo-2 expression, inducing hs 6 sd one 2 3 expression. Our hypothesis and some evidence now point towards the fact that this essentially is controlling how the pro, uh, glycoprotein, unsulfated glycoprotein interact you know, with the slit and the robo. And we are doing a couple of more experiments, you know, uh, explant culture experiments to see if GBX2 is indeed acting upstream of ST1, ST2 by injecting uh, ST1, ST2 in the GBX2 mutant uh, thalamic explant culture to see if we see a rescue of the slit phenotype. So our, one of the broader goals for my project and my uh, the lab that I'm setting up is, is GBX2 the master regulator of multiple HSPG mediated signaling pathways in the thalamus. So I basically plan to extend some of the work, you know, carried on from little findings of my PhD project and elaborate it into a further story. And so that's been uh, and is my lab goal. Since the work was mostly done in uh, my PhD lab, so I will refer, I will uh, certainly acknowledge uh, Professor James Wiley, who was my PhD supervisor, Kathy uh, Rana, and who did a couple of those uh, immunostaining. And without his help, we wouldn't have been able to transition the work literally in my lab. And um, we are uh, thanks to our collaborators from Amity University and of course, and Amity University for giving us uh, the platform to continue uh, research. And a great, um, again, a shout out to Bias uh, Watch India for allowing me to speak on this platform. It has been a great honor and uh, I'm done with my talk. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Malika. That was a fabulous talk that you gave. And uh, we have a question for you in the Q&A box. Uh, so Abhishek is asking how conserved is the heparin sulfate based signaling for exonal navigation? Is it quite similar across other model organisms such as Drosophila or C. elegans? Yes, it is actually because a lot of these studies have been done in Drosophila, C. elegans, zebrafish. And uh, while they don't have, for example, the ST123 isoforms that we spoke about, that is not present in them, but they have the rudimentary versions. 
and uh, with sequ- they also have significant sequence similarity with our uh, human and mouse hspgs and they subsequently do uh, their uh, loss actually does have axonal guidance defects and one key system in which it has been seen is um, in the zebrafish eye in the eye there's in retinal uh, axonal uh, misrouting has been shown when you do not have uh, hspgs so yes it is there in other systems as well okay and one more question from abhilasha how do the biophysical protein complex interaction time scales match with their uh, intracellular time scales that we know that's a very interesting question actually because i am also not a biophysicist so i have just started to think about this and in fact learned from my collaborators okay so uh, but one thing is you know that's why because this is a val- uh, the time scale might be very short in fact so therefore we tend to uh, keep a universal standard we at least when we do our simulations thinking of the biology we keep it to 200 nanoseconds now how much whether that really translates to biology i i don't have the answer but this is the reason why we see in fact we took a 500 nanosecond if you see our slides but uh, uh, we do the we actually analyze only the first 200 nanosecond because everything is assumed to be stabilized after that you know so mm-hmm. till we go far, towards in fact the people were telling me you'll get reviewers questions if you do too long okay so it might not fit with what biologically happens so first 200 nanoseconds we are comfortable and in fact what the biophysicist collaborator told me they have published with 200 nanoseconds biological phenomena so i'm assuming we are not that wrong i see uh, yeah. another question we uh, are getting it's from ornav ghosh uh, so he is complimenting you on fantastic work and hspgcs can potentially capture and pattern the distribution of extracellular slit in tissues any sense if uh, this protein distribution is different in the mutants in the well in the well uh, okay uh, we didn't see we just did rna at that time i didn't have an antibody hoping i'll be able to buy an antibody and do the you know like show the slide sections see in the sections but uh, i don't know that's the answer to the uh, to your question it would be a good thing to see if it is potentially changed you know it might be i don't know okay uh, and i think uh, now the last question in interest of time uh, are there any human developmental disorders known where hspgcs are mutated and what is the extent of damage from such mutations yes certainly uh, there are okay ext1 is the first polymerizing enzyme of the in the hspg pathway and there have been human mutations identified missense mutations of ext1 in which uh, the children uh, who have the mutations uh, have intellectual disability uh, similar to autism spectrum uh, those in the autism spectrum disorder and they have also made a mouse model of the ext1 too and that also has shown socio communicative uh, defects that mouse so yes mm-hmm. certainly and uh, intellectual disability wise this is the first uh, uh, mutant ext1 is a known mutant but other than that ndsp1 another mutant also has an intellectual disability so there are examples where uh, you have cns disorders and uh, hspg is not only its function as i said is a broadly uh, over found throughout the body uh, bone in the bone you know it has a very significant uh, function in um, the signaling so bone a lot of these like for example the ext1 mutant also have a bone deformities so i am not an expert on the bone uh, biology so therefore i wouldn't come in what are the details of that but basically the signaling doesn't happen properly and therefore the bone doesn't form properly is what i understand in these patients i see thank you uh, we have a few more questions uh, coming up in the chat window but in interest of time i request you to kindly type out the answers and interact directly with the sure. people asking the questions Uh, so yeah. thank you very much dr mallika thank you, thank you. we will now uh, move on to our penultimate invited speaker of the day please extend a very warm welcome to dr indrani datta she is an associate professor at nimhans in bangalore 
She and her team works on the etiology of neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's and diabetic neuropathy and the possibility of regenerative repair mechanisms to combat such diseases. Her work has helped generate iPSC uh, stem cell lines with special relevance to Parkinson's disease, both in terms of diagnosis and specificity for Indian patients. Today, she is representing the neuronal, cellular and molecular biology field, and her talk will focus on the role of astrocyte and other niche cells in the CNS as potential targets for therapeutics in neuronal diseases such as Parkinson's disease. Dr. Indrani, thanks a lot for accepting our invitation to talk here, and mic is all yours. Thank you, Poonam, for such a kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon to all, and first I would like to thank Vaishnavi and Shruti for organizing this uh, online conference with a unique concept and inviting me to share our work with you all. So my research group explores the neuronal niche comprising of glial cells, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, Schwann cells. And today I will be sharing a part of our work which we have performed on astrocytes. Uh, the topic being influence of niche cells in dopaminergic neuronal survival in the context of Parkinson's disease. Sorry. So in 1955, after the death of Albert Einstein, the pathologist who was in charge for the autopsy of his brain stole his brain. So there was a good outcome from it. In 1980, a Berkeley scientist discovered that his brain had far more astrocytes than other human brain, which was considered as control. So it strongly indicates that no longer astrocytes can be considered as the second cousin of the nervous system. And herein we have, we give our attempt to understand the role of astrocytes for the survival and function of dopaminergic neurons. In reference to a pathological condition, the selective loss of dopaminergic neurons occur in Parkinson's disease. This loss of dopaminergic neurons brings about decrease in uh, striatal dopamine levels, which is responsible again for the characteristic motor symptoms of the disease. Unfortunately, this disease load is increasing with the urine worldwide. The present treatment strategies target and focuses on dopamine replacement. And as we well know that there are severe side effects and weaning effects of these drugs, which target to increase the dopamine levels in the brain. And it, in spite of all that, it fails to halt the disease progression. So yes, the cure is still a question. Though there are multiple factors, which are even unknown factors, which brings about the onset of the disease, but post-mortem reports of Parkinsonian brain and in vivo studies clearly suggest that oxidative stress is the main player to bring about the cellular dysfunction for this disease progression in the dopaminergic neurons. Now, indirect indices of ROS activity in Parkinsonian brain such as TBA reactive substance or you know elevated levels of 8-hydroxy 2-deoxygonosine, these indicates that definitely ROS activity was present over there and heightened. Why we are talking about the indirect indices? Because ROS has short half-life, so it is near to impossible to measure ROS in living patients and in postmortem tissues. Now, why are dopaminergic neurons vulnerable to oxidative stress because in that region there are other neurons which are also present. Well, these neuronal cells consist iron in its cytosol and along with the neurotransmitter dopamine. Now dopamine is capable of deamination by the enzyme monoamine oxidase resulting in significant yield of hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide then interacts with the reduced form of iron and sets in a Fenton's reaction. And we know very well the production of the highly reactive ROS species hydroxyl radical takes place. Now, to counterbalance this, what do we see in the antioxidant mechanism? Well, there isn't any enhanced antioxidant mechanism for these neurons in special. On top of that, with age-related decline on cellular detoxification enzymes has been reported. Thus, the dual presence of dopamine and iron and the counterbalancing antioxidant system not getting enhanced brings about the vulnerability of DNA neurons to oxidative stress. Now, is this degeneration of dopamine
response restricted only to substantia nigra of the midbrain? Well, there are reports that in the VTA region and in other catecholaminergic cell group areas, the D neurons do not degenerate. The main difference between these two regions of the brain is the density of astrocytes. And this data is with respect to the postmortem findings. Now coming to the neuroprotective effect or the supportive role uh, which the astrocytes play, well, it has a multi pronged approach by which it brings about its action. Be it secretion of neurotropic factors, uptake of glutamate to avoid excitotoxicity, then metabolizing this glutamate to glutamine to give it back to the neuronal cells, potassium and calcium buffering, and even for the defense mechanism, like giving the glutathione, the reduced form of glutathione to the new specialized neuronal cells, because neuronal cells do not have the capability to for de novo synthesis of glutathione. Now, another complexity also we got to find is that there are heterogeneity being reported with respect to astrocytes from different regions of the brain with respect to expression of membrane transporter and gap junction channels and neuropeptides well till then there weren't any in vitro work showing a cellular crosstalk and its significance that how these astrocytes with respect to the number and region specificity brings about a difference in the survival and function of dopaminergic neurons. So for that, we isolated and purified astrocytes from three regions of postnatal day two rat brain, forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain. After purification, we plated them onto the inserts of transfer. In parallel, we performed the rat midbrain neuronal culture from embryonic day 16 rat pup and these cells, well, this rat midbrain culture, we had already established and published that here the neuron glia ratio is similar to that which is present in an adult midbrain, uh, rat midbrain. Further, the downstream uh, functional assays, be it survival, and the mode of neuroprotection even was performed for the midbrain cultures. Now, characterization for the midbrain neuronal cells with respect to dopaminergic neuronal marker expression was performed. Even the astrocyte characterization and uh, quantification for its purified yield, what we got, uh, was also estimated for all the three regions. And the astrocytes were seeded onto the inserts with respect to 10,000, 50,000, 80,000 to two lab cells per transfer. So what we found was that when with increase in density or the number of astrocytes, indeed we found the live cell population in the midbrain culture increased, be it we assessed with MTT assay or with an XNPI staining and measuring them through flow cytometry. In parallel, the ROS generation too decreased and we did not find in particular any difference between the different regions of the astrocytes, uh, the astrocytes been isolated. So the increase in cell survival and decrease in ROS generation was observed under stress with increase in number of astrocytes. No difference in cell survival was observed with respect to region specificity. So we delved into a little more details. Now what happens to particular signature of neuronal cells and even the astrocyte population because the midbrain culture had mature neuronal cells with, along with dopaminergic neuronal cells and even some part of astrocytes too. Now, uh, the similar effect on uh, the beta tibulin 3 expressing immunopositive neuronal cells and even on the glial cells was found with respect to astrocytes being present from three different regions of the brain. The difference or the highlight came for the TH immunopositive neuronal cells. These were again estimated through flow cytometric estimation and higher survival of TH positive dopaminergic neurons was observed in the presence of midbrain astrocytes and in particular from 50,000 astrocytes in the transvels. So once uh, then we progressed for the function of whether we are seeing a recovery of the function or not. Well, the, the main function which we chose over here was the vesicular release of dopamine upon physiological stimulation with KCL and ATP. 
So what we found for the midbrain uh, neuronal culture, that indeed in the presence of midbrain astrocytes, the dopamine secretion increased, the induced dopamine secretion. And uh, a thing to note over here, though, that it did not recover till the control levels. They were definitely higher than the just 6 oh treated cells, but it did not reach to the control levels. Well, in our earlier uh, work, we had seen, uh, which was published in JCB, that uh, the effect of 6 oh even in the sublethal level, had brings about a modification of alpha-synuclein, that is a phosphorylated alpha-synuclein at serine 129, which occurs concomitantly with a decrease in vesicular release and decrease in VMAT2. So here too, we went ahead to find out the signature of the piece of nuclein, whether that recovery is obtained or not. So unfortunately, no, definitely, we did not find a significant difference in the piece of nuclein levels. And might be this is the contributory factor for the dopamine secretion not coming up to the control levels. So as uh, we all know that neurotropic factor secretion is the primary role of astrocytes for survival of dopaminergic neurons. Indeed, we found a difference in the BDNF gene expression in the midbrain much higher than the other counterparts from forebrain and hindbrain astrocytes. So whether to confirm this, we went ahead to do flow cytometry detection of BDNF immunopositive astrocytes in adult midbrain region. And indeed over here, we found a mimic of the same uh, situation wherein the astrocytes of the midbrain regions where far more higher expression of BDNF was obtained. Now coming to the secretion or, or the constitutive release of BDNF, here too, we found that the constitutive release of BDNF was higher for the midbrain astrocytes. Now there are further studies in the literature where they have shown that in the presence of stress, astrocytes of different brain regions express a different amount of neurotransmitter, uh, neurotropic factors. So here too, we kept the stress factor, which is the endotoxin 6 hda and we saw what happens to the inducible release of VDNF. Indeed, the inducible release of VDNF was still higher for the midbrain astrocytes, stating that probably intrinsically, the midbrain astrocytes express and secrete more of VDNF than its forebrain and hindbrain counterparts. We had also done a Western lot protein estimation to find the ratio of mature BDNF to pro-BDNF. Well, pro-BDNF secreted at 32 kilodaltons, which is terminally cleaved by Transgolgi network to mature BDNF. And here to the Ex the comparative uh, higher expression was found in the midbrain astrocytes. So uh, next, we came to understand that, okay, fine, these midbrain astrocytes are releasing more of BDNF, but was this the one which is contributing to that increase in TH cells which we observed in the midbrain culture? So that's why we designed our experiment wherein we indu induced uh, an inhibition of the TRKB receptor, which is a BDNF receptor in the BDNF, in the midbrain culture using ANA12. And we found indeed the recovery has got reversed. Therefore stating that BDNF definitely was important for bringing about the recovery of the TH immunopositive cells in the midbrain culture in the presence of 80,000 astrocytes in the transvel. Now, just to summarize, I, the, till here, we know that the BDNF is intrinsically getting expressed more in the midbrain region, the inducible BDNF is still higher in the midbrain astrocytes. And yes, indeed, it contributes to the recovery of the TH immunopositive DNA neurons. Since it was a stress-induced release of BDNF was much higher than the constitutive release of BDNF, so we hypothesized, and it was obvious indicated, that there must have been a diffusible signal which is acting over here. Well, nitric oxide is a very important diffusible signal which is known to regulate BDNF gene 2 through the activation of protein G kinase and even ERK activation. So we went ahead to, again, further design the experiment such that we use the inhibitor for NOS, which is responsible for secretion or regeneration of NO, and also a NO donor, that is data NO, to quantify and understand as a positive control that, yes, indeed, in these astrocytes, there is NO-induced BDNF release, which we are observing. 
So with respect to this experimental design, what we found that the nitrite expression was similar, comparable for all three regions of astrocytes. But again, when the LMA was uh, you know, present over there in the extracellular milieu, we see a reduction in the BDNF release. And here too, the BDNF release was far higher in the midbrain astrocytes than its other counterparts. Even the intrinsic uh, release of uh, BDNF being higher in the astrocytes from midbrain region was uh, reflected in the positive control experiment where we had used data NO. Next, uh, so we understand that there was definitely an autocrine uh, signaling event which is happening within the astrocytes to in the, in the presence of oxidative stress, which releases furthermore uh, BDNF. So, but we had also seen a further increase of BDNF when we had done the co-culture with the midbrain neuronal cells. So here too, we designed, I'm not going in details, again, we played around with the wells and we gave the L name to decrease the NO production. And we went ahead to check the BDNF release, which is occurring in these system. And what we can understand that not only an autocrine, autocrine, but also a paracrine NO signal was responsible for the BDNF release. And definitely it made a difference in recovering the TH immunopositive cells in the midbrain culture when they were under the stress, the endogenous oxidative stress of 6-hydroxydopamine. So NO-induced BDNF release was uh, determined the relatively higher secretion of BDNF by midbrain definitely made a difference. And most important that the number and the region specificity and optimization of these two are extremely important for the survival of dopaminergic neurons. Well, this part of the work was performed by uh, my first PhD student, Kavina, and uh, next on, uh, the second student started out, Ashwarya started out her work in context to Parkinson's disease. So increasing work is showing that alpha-synuclein inclusions are not limited to dopaminergic neurons. It's also been found in the astrocytes. Now, we have to remember alpha-synuclein is not an endogenous protein of astrocytes. It's the most likely way it has gone inside the astrocytes or associated with astrocytes. It's from the extracellular milieu. So, uh, we initially targeted the key important function of astrocytes, that's the antioxidant machinery and the glutamate metabolic profile in the presence of four forms of alpha-synuclein peptides, the wild-type monomer, wild-type aggregate, the double mutant monomer and the double mutant aggregate. So uh, the biophysical method, we had performed the aggregation of the uh, monomeric peptides and uh, we did multiple uh, you know, estimation of whether the aggregation has happened and through THD fluorescence and K100 coating uh, fluorescence. On top of that, to understand the size of the species in the aggregates, we went ahead to do dynamic light scattering, wherein we found multiple species to be coming out in the wild type aggregate, unlike that in the mutant aggregate. And the size difference was quite, quite different. Here in the wild type aggregate, it, it was within the scale of um, 90 nanometer to uh, 900 nanometer, whereas over there for the mutant aggregate, it differed from 900 to 9,000 nanometer. Now, this was further reconfirmed through atomic force microscopy. Why? Because these are three-dimensional species, moieties. So we needed to know the uh, Z configuration too. And uh, we had done the estimation through this. And here too, what we can understand that the mutant aggregate is definitely a much larger entity. And uh, the wild type aggregates are multiple species varying in smaller sizes than the larger mutant aggregates. Now, this uh, aggregation pattern was important to understand and the bulkiness of the peptide was important to understand that a probability of a heterogeneity in data can be dependent on this bulkiness or this biophysical parameter of these aggregates. Now, uh, with increasing concentration of the monomers, we found that the lethality of the astrocytes increased and the mutant forms were definitely more lethal and even within the species, again, the aggregates of the wild type and the mutant were more lethal than the monomeric forms. 
So here, uh, it's a qualitative assessment of uh, how they are associated or whether they are associated with the astrocytes or not. We had tagged the alpha-synuclein with DY light 488, which emits a green fluorescence. And GFAP was tagged with TRITSI to give red fluorescence counter stain for the nuclei with DAPI. And this was further biophysically assessed, the quantification done through flow cytometry. So what we get to find is definitely the monomeric forms are associating more, and the mutant form showed more stickiness than the wild type. Now, when we say about association, it can be either engulfment and and many times in earlier papers, it was been uh, taken that they're definitely engulfment and membrane association too. So over here, we tweaked the endocytosis process to understand that how much is getting contributed for each of them with endocytosis and that is engulfment or through membrane association. So interestingly, under the low extracellular potassium concentration, what we get to find is that the association of the engulfment of the monomeric forms is decreased immensely, whereas for the aggregated forms, we do not see the decrease in association much, suggesting that due to their bulkiness, majority of these peptides in the aggregated forms are associated with the membrane. ROS generation again was uh, estimated because we had gone ahead with survival and we are looking into the antioxidant system. So indeed, we had to check what is the ROS signature over here. Here to increasing concentration, increased ROS generation and the mutant forms were uh, produce more ROS and the wild type form beat the ROS and beat the nitric oxide. Now, antioxidant regulation in the central nervous system is modulated by the astrocytic and RF2 ARE pathway. What we found first is that this NRF2 expression decreased through Western lot. We had seen that estimation. And visually, we looked into the localization through immunofluorescence, wherein the nuclear localization was decreased with the peptide uh, association, and especially with respect to the mutant ones. Now, glutathione, as I had mentioned earlier, it is it can be present in two forms, the reduced form and the oxidized form. Now, why is it important? Because the astrocytes are the sole players in the nervous system to provide the glutathione to the neuronal cells. So it's an extremely important antioxidant substrate. At a particular time point, the cellular GSH levels will therefore depend on the oxidation by increased ROS, its biosynthesis by glutathione synthetase, its reduction of the oxidized form to the reduced form by the glutathione reductase, and the oxidation of the GSH, GSH to the GSSG by glutathione peroxidase. It will be also monitored or by the efflux through its transporter, which is MRP1, and all of these are controlled by NRF2. So we went ahead to detect this uh, so I'll go and point out to the main highlights. We found a distinct decrease in glutathione and definitely the mutant aggregate showed the highest decline in glutathione. So what we found in the mutant aggregate is that not only a biosynthesis, the de novo biosynthesis of GSH is getting affected, but also the reduction of GSSG to GSH is getting affected. Though the oxidation of the GSH to G the oxidized form is getting affected and the transporter is not making a difference, but still it is not good enough to counteract to the re reduction in the biosynthesis and reduction in the oxidized form to the reduced form. So we get to find that uh, the transporters are definitely unaltered and the GSH reduction is more severe for the mutant aggregate. And uh, again, the reductors, the reduction in the reductors definitely plays an important role in bringing about this reduction of glutathione in the cytosol of the astrocytes. And the highest decline of NRF2 expression in the presence of the mutant aggregate was reflected consistently with the highest decrease in the GPX, CSS, and glutathione reductors for the same. The other machinery, which is very important for the astrocytes are and the astrocyte neuronal crosstalk is the glutamate glutamine cycle. We all know the first most important is the uptake of glutamate so that it avoids the excitotoxicity in the myelin over there, but it doesn't stop there just uptake is not good enough. 
This glutamate gets converted to glutamine and this glutamine is released out so that it is uptaken back by the glutamatergic and GABAergic neurons for the precursor for their neurotransmitters and even for energy metabolism. The amount, this glutamate can again get converted also to alpha-ketoglutarate and that enters the TCK cycle to provide ATP in the astrocytes. So what we find over here again, the multi few of the key enzymes which are important with respect to glutamate conversion to glutamine, pyruvate, the de novo synthesis of glutamate from pyruvate, and the conversion of glutamate to alpha-ketoglutarate. Now, each of these questions we had, what is happening and whether the signature is different between the monomers and aggregates and between the wild type and the mutants. So when we went ahead with the cellular function of glutamate uptake, because till then in literature, we found uh, that most of the studies suggest that there is glutamate excess in the region of sub substantia nigra and quite possibly due to for, um, you know, excitotoxicity setting in. But here we were de determining the uptake function of the astrocytes. And interestingly, we found the uptake to be highest in the, it is increasing in the presence of all the forms and highest in the mutant form. So we immediately looked into the, or determined qualitative, quantitatively through flow cytometry, the expression of GLAS-1 in these astrocytes. And the GLAS-1 definitely contributed to this uptake because it's quite high expression was found in the aggregates in comparison to their mutant, to their monomer counterparts. Coming to the other uh, transporter, which is known for uptake of glutamate, which is GLT-1, because these are rat astrocytes, so hence we went ahead with class 1 and GLT-1. Well, uh, the GLT-1 expression uh, was not increased. The de novo synthesis of uh, glutamate, again, got increased, especially in the, uh, in the mutant aggregate form. And the glutamate to glutamine synthesis, that conversion again significantly decreased in the mutant aggregated forms. Gene expression of the GDH was decreased in the aggregated forms in comparison to their counterparts of the monomeric forms. But we carried out a functional assay with live cell imaging of glutamate to the GDH activity, which converts glutamate to alpha ketoglutarate, wherein we the, so I'll just show you two videos of the control and the mutant aggregate. So how do we get to see the fluorescence? So while it is converting glutamate to alpha-ketoglutarate, it also reduces NAD to NADH. And this exhibits blue fluorescence in UV light. So that's what we uh, had estimated and quantified through a time-lapse imaging for 500 seconds. Now, it is very clear that the mutant aggregate enzyme activity is definitely increased, even though the expression is decreased. Now, the next question arises that, oh, it's all this well, it's taking up glutamate more. That means the existing neuronal cells must be hale and hearty and happy. So we had this query. So we went ahead to uh, do an ex vivo experiment from adult rat midbrain and took uh, 300 micron midbrain sections. We took out, dissected out the cortical area and exposed them to the wild type and the mutant aggregated forms to check what happens after the same time point of insult with the aggregates to the dopaminergic neuronal population and other glial cells which are present over there. What we found is that definitively the TH neurons are still showing the highest decrease in under the insult of the aggregates and the highest pain in the presence of the mutant aggregate in comparison to the GFAP population or the oligodendrocyte population or even the microglial population. So the picture stays over here that that uptake of glutamate is not very happy for the TH neurons. Why so? Because as I said, that a glutamate uptake alone does not determine a neuroprotection. There is a metabolism which is involved with respect to the availability of the glutamine, which is and probably is the most important factor for the neuronal survival. So this is the work which is further going on downstream with respect to energy metabolism and how it is interacting and 
with the neuronal cells when we are co-culturing them. So what we understand in a nutshell is definitely the monomers and of wild type and the mutant and in their aggregated forms have heterogenic uh, you know, response with respect to the alteration in the antioxidant machinery and the glutamate metabolic profile. So the, it alters the antioxidant machinery and glutamate metabolic profile. And what we can state from this as a take home message is that one size fit all approach cannot be adopted for tackling monomer and aggregates and more cellular based experiments has to be performed to understand and decode each of these functional activity of astrocytes and in turn their interaction with the neuronal cells of interest. Definitely, as you had always seen throughout our data, that the aggregates showed higher membrane association. So we know that which kind uh, or where to target in eventually for drugs with respect to aggregates. And it also highlights the importance of additional, as I said, studies to address the role of other cellular events of astrocytes in the pathogenesis behind Parkinson's disease and even for alpha-synuclepathies. And it would allow us to consider these niche cells as a potential target for therapeutic strategies. So with that, I'll um, end our, my presentation. I would first like to acknowledge the funding agencies, uh, Innovative Young Biotechnologist Award from DBT uh, and Department, again, DBT for funding another project on astrocytes and extracellular alpicinuclein, infrastructure and all help from the enhanced. The AFN Microscopy Facility at ISC, my PhD students, and thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Indrani, for this fantastic talk. We have lots and lots of questions in the Q&A box, yes. uh, but uh, we are above time already. So I'll uh, try to post few questions to you live. And I yes. request you to take on the remaining questions in the chat if possible. Yes, definitely. All right, so first question is from Shreyas uh, Garge. Uh, so he's asking, is there a link between BDNF release and ATP regulated channels that link metabolism with dopaminergic neuron activity? Since neuroglyovascular models take in ATP production rate as control parameters. Yes, definitely. ATP, uh, if there is requirement of ATP for any function of any neuronal function, so definitely uh, BDNF, it is very well known that if you don't provide BDNF in your culture media, even when you are uh, generating dopaminergic neurons from IPSCs, you won't get survival of dopaminergic neurons. So it is as basic as that need which the BDNF has on dopaminergic neurons. Now coming to its interaction with the ATP requirement, yes, Further, ATP requirement is required for the function of dopaminergic neurons, and it will play a role hand in hand with the ATP requirement of these neuronal cells. Yes. All right. Um, now we have a question from Ankur Chakraborty. He is asking: Do astrocytes have dopamine receptors? If yes, does it contribute to Parkinson's? Yes, astrocytes also do have dopamine receptors. And uh, yeah, there are also studies on how dopamine transporters rather uh, would be having an effect on uh, the neurotransmitter uptake and its release and eventually having an effect on the dopaminergic neurons. So I would rather say they, are, they have the dopaminergic neuron, uh, dopamine transporter rather than dopamine receptors. All right, uh, next question is from Ranjita Gopa, um, Gopurapilli. After treatment with alpha synuclein monomers and aggregates, are the astrocytes becoming reactive? And if yes, uh, when co-cultured with these uh, the, uh, with neurons, do they induce cell death? Yeah, a very good question, Ranjita. So uh, I've not shared the data over here. So indeed, uh, when there is an energy metabolism which we are un understanding is going wrong, so there would be um, senescence and aging which will be also setting in due to the secretion of the SASPs, the senescent-related 
uh, profiles which get secreted by astrocytes. And yes, indeed, we find an inflammatory signature in these um, astrocytes, which are treated with the aggregates in particular. And uh, definitely we are looking into our next uh, progression of work will be to look into how these SASPs and senescence brings about, uh, you know, getting it switched from a neuroprotective role to a neurodamaging role for a neuron lack of crosstalk. Okay, and one uh, last question. This is coming from uh, Dr. Vidita Vaidya. Uh, is all the BDNF signaling in this context via TRKB? And what is the role of P75 NTR and truncated TRKB in this system? Yes, here we had uh, looked into the only the TRKB inhibitor, definitely. So the TRKB inhibitor uh, receptor is known to be majorly involved with the BDNF-related neuroprotective effect. So these neurotropic factors which goes through the NGF receptor pathway that induces further apoptosis. So over here, um, when we saw that the indication was survival and more availability or more yield of the TH immunopositive cells, so we had used the inhibitor for the TRKB receptors. So that's that, and definitely we will need to then look into the inhibitor of the other one. Um, with our data, we definitely understand the recovery contribution by the TRKB channel is much more important. All right. Uh, then with this, uh, we will end this talk. Thanks a lot once again, Dr. Indrani, for uh, the, giving this wonderful talk. Uh, now it's so time much. for the final invited speaker of the day, Dr. Kanaka Rajan. Unfortunately, she was uh, unable to join us herself, but she has kindly sent a video recording uh, of her talk that we will be playing. Uh, so because she is not uh, here uh, in person or live, we won't be taking any questions for her talk. Um, so she is an assistant professor at ICA School of Medicine in New York City. She works on understanding how important cognitive behaviors such as learning, remembering, and deciding emerge from cooperative activity of multi-scale neuronal processes. Uh, she has won Friedman Brain, uh, Brain Institute Research Scholars Award and an Alfred P. Sloan Research Fellowship in Neuroscience in 2019. Her talk is about um, a computational framework of how current flows across different parts of the brain, age in uh, understanding different behaviors such as depression and anxiety across various models, including zebrafish, mice, non-human primates, and humans. Um, in her absence, we nonetheless thank her for accepting our invitation to give a talk in this conference. Um, the audio is not coming out. My colleagues and uh, key collaborators, primarily. All right, it's, it's there. Thank you also for the introduction. So I'll just dive right in. Um, and talk about you know the, the amazing people who did most of this work. Um, I'd like to thank my colleagues and uh, key collaborators, primarily Matt Perrick, who's an extremely talented postdoc, um, also a primate physiologist who's on the job market, incidentally. So you know, watch out, everyone. And Camille Spencer Salmon, a very talented MD PhD student in my lab. Uh, they've done the bulk of the heavy lifting on the stuff that I'm going to talk about today. Um, I'd also like to thank Tyler Benster and Carl Dizeroth for the generosity in providing the data that I will explain a little bit about today. Um, I have other collaborators also, as you see on this slide. Uh, their work um, is in a methods paper that we're currently writing on the subject that I'll tell you. Um, I'd also like to thank my funding sources for their faith. Um,
Yeah, so it looks like uh, we're having a little bit of trouble playing back her talk. Just hold on a second and we'll try to load it back again. Um, and uh, hopefully this time we get it right. Thank you also for the introduction. So I'll just dive right in. Uh, so, you know, watch out everyone. And Camille Spencer Salmon, a very talented MD PhD student in my lab. Uh, they've done the bulk of the heavy lifting on the stuff that I'm gonna talk about today. Um, I'd also like to thank Tyler Benster and Carl Dizeroth for the generosity in providing the data that I will explain a little bit about today. Um, I have other collaborators also, as you see on this slide, uh, their work um, is in a methods paper that we're currently writing on the subject that I'll tell you. Um, I'd also like to thank my funding sources for their faith um, in our ideas. All right, so, um, I mean, you know, we, we live in this amazing time when people are recording more and more activity, more is considered better, just record everything from, you know, every single unit, if possible, from uh, multiple brain regions in awake behaving animals. So we're really in this, you know, the second revolution almost in experimental neuroscience, right? The first one was when we went from recording individual neurons to recording a bunch of neurons. Now we're doing a bunch of neurons in a bunch of brain regions in awake behaving animals, sometimes in multiple animals. And so we're in this amazing, you know, kind of time. Um, and, and what people normally do is, you know, record, let's say from neural pixels or, you know, even wide field imaging activity that I have, you know, symbolized in this cartoon image. And people have, people do, you know, manifold based analyses. Uh, they do dimensionality reduction on these types of data. Um, and, uh, you know, my, my postdoc in his graduate work, Matt Perrick has written a bunch of papers. Many others have also on analyzing these types of um, massive scale neural population activity. And what they find consistently is, you know, neural activity traverses a trajectory in this type of low dimensional space. I'm only explaining this in cartoon form for now. On another trial, the trajectory may deviate a little bit from this one, but suffice it to say that this trajectory occupies some kind of low dimensional subspace or a neural manifold in this, in this space. Um, the axes of which are given by the, the, the vectors of the, of the covariance matrix. So the covariance matrix is considered this, you know, uh, succinct mathematical representation of population activity, but what are the inputs that drive this covariance, right? That's a that's kind of a subtle question because these inputs that really shape the covariance of population activity that is a subject of so much um, so much research and interest now could actually be brain-wide interactions, right? So these are interactions amongst different, you know, interacting brain regions, potentially brain-wide. So I've expressed that in terms of this cartoon that you see on the left. I'm hoping everyone can see my cursor. So area A by this, you know, blue blob, area B by the yellow one, area C by this one. And, you know, brain-wide interactions are the things that really shape neural manifolds. And so when people do, you know, experimental measurements or look at these low dimensional representations, there are a few things, um, I'm gonna move your, your faces to the other side of my screen. So there are a few things that are inaccessible from measurements alone. And those things are, inputs to each neuron from within and across brain regions, the directionality of these interactions and effects of common input. So what I mean by that is in this cartoon, are A and B, are regions A and B reciprocally connected to each other or is this unidirectional connection with no feedback projections, for example? Do A and B project to area C or does C project back to A and B simultaneously acting as a common input that may correlate the activity of A and B? 
And how do you scale these methods to multiple regions, right? So most of these common methods, although we are, although you know many groups are currently pushing the envelope on this, can we scale current methods of um, inferring these types of brain-wide interactions to more than two regions? So he, one approach that my lab takes is to build multi-region recurrent neural network models, um, abbreviated RNNs here. And what I do is to build these models that are constrained directly by neural and behavioral data. See, my, my understanding is, well, you know, there are all these data, so why not use them to train these networks in the first place um, and, and then see what you get, right? So I constrain these RNN models directly by neural and behavioral data. And I'm not gonna talk about all of these examples today in this rather, you know, flashy uh, diagram, but I want to give you a flavor of the types of data sets that we have access to. So, you know, when we build these models, we validate them on ground truth data sets, such as this toy model that, you know, you see in this little gears here, about order thousand units, anywhere between three and you know 20 areas or RNNs that are reciprocally connected to each other. Um, I'm gonna talk about the larval zebrafish data set, which is a small brain that is sampled very, very densely. And so in the experimental data set I'll talk about, it's about half the brain of the entire animal over an extended behavior. And again, the order is about 100 to 1,000 units per area of which NM is a number of modules, three and 13 areas. Um, and then we have, you know, comparable numbers in mice, in macaques, and in humans. So now if I were thinking like, you know, one of those industry engineering labs, I would want to apply this, you know, brute force thing of saying, as you move from one model system to the other, right, the sampling, there's an enormous partial sampling issue that becomes more and more grave, right? You're actually sampling a minuscule percentage of the actual activity, even if you could look at all of them in, in these larger systems, right? So one could set up a literal analogy where I could have 175 billion parameters and then subsample from it. But what I'm here to tell you is that even with qualitatively similar numbers, right? we're still able to make progress, right? And so once we constrain these networks directly with neural and in some cases neural and behavioral data, we analyze the networks using new methods like such as the one I'm gonna tell you about today, but also using similar ones as those used on the recording, such as these low dimensional manifolds and looking at these subspaces and null spaces in, in um, state space. So I've written a few papers on the subject. Um, and so, you know, if anybody has questions, I'd encourage you to, especially our younger colleagues, um, I would encourage you to write to me afterwards or during or whatever and, and, and talk about them. And so the, the goal of this entire exercise is to infer circuit mechanisms very broadly defined, very overused term, which are not easy to get at from measurements alone. So that's the one of the methods that I'm going to talk to you about today. So a, a key interest, and this is a luxury that we have as theorists, right, is to ask a question like this, which may sound wild to experimentalists, right, which is, are there any circuit mechanisms that are conserved when you go from a small nervous system that you're sampling extensively to larger and larger nervous systems where, you know, not just the complexity of the representations, but also the sampling reduces dramatically. So are there circuit mechanisms that are conserved and which of them are divergent? They're both interesting from, you know, uh, from, from a theorist perspective. But under that broad umbrella, I want to narrow this down to one particular problem here, and I'll tell you about it today. So I'm going to tell you about this one technique of how we build these multi-region RNNs. So the basic network design element is something that you know should be familiar to a bunch of people whose names I recognize um, and whose papers I've followed with, uh, with a lot of pleasure over the years. Uh, my PhD work was in these types of rate-based models, so continuous um, analog variables, uh, randomly connected initially. So the initial connectivity is you know, drawn, drawn from a Gaussian IID centered at zero. These are very uh, mathematically elegant models that may or may not have anything to do with the real brain, but you know, we can get into that conversation later. So the way that we design these networks is you can get to know everything you need to know about these models if you knew the firing rate of everyone in the network and if you knew the weight with which they connected to everyone else, right? 
they follow this, you know, first order differential equation with a certain time constant. And there's a few key elements um, to keep. Uh, and so for those of you who are so familiar with this, you know, you can tune out and then I'll tell you when to tune back in. Um, and, you know, here I have, you know, drawn a few cartoon filtered white noise traces to take the place of inputs. Haim Sampolinsky did some very foundational work on networks like this without inputs um, back in the 80s. Um, I came along um, a few decades later and did this with, uh, with you know, time varying inputs, specifically periodic inputs. Here I've just shown you irregular ones. Uh, the key thing to notice here is a transfer function. We can use any your favorite saturating nonlinearity. Um, we can we also pick the connectivity matrix or this entity G, which I would like to slow down for a second because we've kind of renamed this directed interactions, not to be perverse, but because we're training these networks to match time varying data. And those data might not be cellular resolution data, right? So when I'm talking about human data, it could be LFPs from, I don't know, 10 different blobs in the brain. So I just want to infer the strength and direction or, or you know, strength and sign by which each element in this model or model unit interacts with everyone else. So I'm calling them directed interactions. The pre's are in the column and the posts are in the, in the rows. So it's the exact same as what you're used to seeing as the J matrix. In the very initial condition, these are drawn from a Gaussian um, balance centered at zero, and the variance is scaled by this factor G squared over N. Haim had shown in this you know, amazing paper, uh, which actually took me almost a year to even you know, re-derive, um, is you know, interesting little side note. Um, that, that you know, at, at G of one, networks like this in the absence of inputs become spontaneously active and the spontaneous activity takes the form of chaos. So you take this basic network architecture and then we destroy it in two ways, right? The first thing we do is to wire more of them together. So this is the thing that I, so what, what I was trying to tell you is to go from a single module to multi-region RNNs. We take a module like this and then we connect it to others. So, you know, back to the same cartoon, there's an RNN A, B, and C that are wired together with inter-area projections like I'm showing you in the cartoon. The directed interaction matrix of the initial configuration is still the same, you know, kind of random as I'm showing you in this cartoon here. Um, the multi-region RNNs, uh, directed interactions, can acquire interesting structures. So for example, if the inter-area projections come out to be sparser or are designed to be sparser, as we know they are in several cortical architectures, extremely sparse, then these sort of off-diagonal submatrices or blocks, um, and again, I'm fervently hoping you can see my cursor, these will be sparser. And then these connections that are shown in these, you know, almost darker blocks along the principal diagonal will be the within region connections, which should be denser. So looking at a matrix like this, lets me look at interactions or direct, or, you know, the sign and the magnitude of the weight by which units in region A or RNN A connect with each other, region uh, RNN B and RNN C along this principal diagonal, and then interactions between uh, B and A here and between C and A over there. So that's the first way we destroy exactly what I told you about my entire PhD work. The second way we destroy it is to take um, a network like this and we train every unit to match something that comes directly from data. So here's an example of how that works. Uh, the algorithm is traditionally called recursive least squares. So the activity of a unit, which I'm calling here ZI, I for the unit and of T, as I'm showing you here in this kind of irregular red cartoon trace, is matched against a target that can be derived from calcium data directly. For the human and the monkey examples, we take the actual spiking activity, convolve it with something that turns it you know, continuous like a Gaussian, and we use those as targets and those are symbolized as fi of t. The learning error is the instantaneous difference between those two objects. And that thing drives the update for the entire J matrix, the entire directed interaction matrix at every time step. So the learning algorithm will keep cranking until the learning error goes to zero. The blue trace starts to look like the red trace and you're done, right? Okay, so what does this buy you, right? This is a very supervised, you know, learning algorithm and kindly note, I'm not using this to 
call it a plasticity mechanism or anything. It's wildly biologically unrealistic, but it kind of gets us to, you know, what kind of structures will match the activity once trained, right? So what does this buy you? This buys us three things. Okay, and also to tell you like in the examples that I'll show you today, I will be using networks that are as big as the size of the data set. However, we've done validations where we've taken a large network and trained only a small subset of the, of the weights and the units. We've also done the exercise where we've taken a small trained network and embedded it in a much larger untrained milieu. Um, okay, so what does this buy us, right? This buys us, once trained, the network produces realistic in air quotes, neural dynamics, which I'm symbolizing here in this phi of xi set. And yes, this is a medium sized warp, right? Because, well, you know, you're training these networks to do this, so of course they'll do that, right? What you can also do is sort of look under the hood uh, in a very, you know, I, I forget that the hosts are European, it's, a, it's an American saying. Yeah. Anyway, you can infer the directed interaction matrix, which I'm symbolizing here by the JM, and you can look at, well, you know, does, you know, you can look at the within, inter, within region interactions and between region interactions in separate submodules. Sub Looking at properties of these matrix is fascinating for us, less fascinating for experimentalists, but you know, there we are. The thing that I'm really starting to get excited about is the dot product of those two objects. And that's the basis of the, of the method that we're currently developing and working on a manuscript for. So the currents due to recurrence, if you remember the equation from a couple of slides ago, is a dot product of the activity and this matrix, right? So what am I saying here? So first of all, we call this method current-based decomposition. So once you train this network, right, region A, B, and C matched against data from, let's say, three different regions in some experimental prep, you get this matrix in which the, you know, the blue sub matrix tells you that within a region A connections, the B to A connections and the one next to it and the C to A connections next to it, right? And so on and so forth. Now the dot product of those two objects gives you the current due to recurrent interactions in this trained network. Now, if I just sum over this little index J, right? I can look at the experience of, let's say, a unit in region A to uh, from other units in region A. I can also look at how, what portion of the currents in region A come from, you know, interactions from region B and how many, how much of the currents seen in region A come from region C. The sum of all three still give you the activity you would have recorded from A. But without this matrix, you couldn't decompose these. And you need the RNN to get the matrix in the first place. So you can't do this with just clever data analysis. So here's this, you know, one more cartoon to really drive home the point, right? So let's say you're recording activity from three regions, right? And we've shown you here one, you know, example. This is, let's say, you know, neural activity in some form, firing rate or calcium activity as a function of time. Region A does the squiggle, region B does this, you know, little wave-like thing, region C does this almost like a fixed point that goes to another one at a certain, um, at, at a certain time step. Once you run this exercise, you can decompose the activity that you observe in region A into its component currents. So the A to A currents are, are made by summing over just the A neurons within this matrix, right? And so you get, you know, the currents from A to A, the currents from B to A, and the currents from C to A separately. Right? So it gives you the ability to take the output activity that you've actually recorded and decompose the source currents from the exact same one. You can do the same exercise for region B and region C. So, so this is the valid, so now what I'm gonna tell you about is a validation of this method on idealized you know, ground truth data, which is you know, the top bit of that little circle. So let's say you have three RNNs here, right? This would be the generator model, right? Let's say I make up some data. I take three RNNs connected reciprocally to each other. RNN A, right, the one in blue, that thing is, you know, spontaneously active. It's chaotic. It's not receiving any external inputs. RNN B in yellow is receiving this type of external input, completely artificially designed. Each unit receives one of these. This is units by time. External input, which is sequential, driven, given to region B. And RNN C gets a fixed point like input that switches to another fixed point. So RNN B and C are being driven. RNN A is only being driven indirectly through these projections from the other two regions, right? 
So this is our generator model. And so here is neuronal activity as a function of time or the model's activity as a function of time in region A. We've picked the parameters so that it's you know, chaotic, doesn't have any sign of receiving anything from these other two. Region B kind of, you, you know, decouple your eyeballs, looks like it's receiving some kind of sequential thing, right? You can see some pattern here. Region C has a fixed point like structure, you know, constant firing rates that go to another constant firing rate at a certain time point. So this is the generator model. So how do we do the curved exercise? We take an RNN, which has three times as many units. So each of these has a thousand units in the simulation. So the model RNN or the one that's trained to fit this object, that has 3000 of them. I'm only showing you, you know, obviously in a little cartoon. And we take this network and we fit each, each one has a target function and we fit this full object to all of these activity patterns. And out pops this directed interaction matrix where the pre and the post are in the rows, are in the columns and the rows respectively, weights within A, B, and C along the diagonal and inter area connections in the across diagonal submatrices. The RNN model, you know, the model fits the activity that it is meant to fit. Again, a very small sized whoop because that's what these networks are designed to do. Now we run the curved exercise, right? And we can decompose the activity of region A or you know, decompose the RNNs fit from region A into its component currents. Now you can see something clever happening. These are all region A units, right? As a function of time. Now the currents from A to A look chaotic and irregular. The currents from B to A now reflect the sequential input that only went to region B. And the currents from C to A reflect this fixed point switching to another fixed point that only RNN, RNN and C saw. The sum of all these three give you the activity in RNN A, right? If you were to be recording from region A in the absence of doing any of these things, you would only be looking at activity in region A and not knowing that that activity was composed of these other two components or the sources, right? So then one thing I will show you in the real example is that we can do the exact same exercise of dimensionality reduction and projecting into state space, everything that people do with output activity. So here's region A's activity that I've projected into the dominant principal component vectors and you know, it does what it does. We can also do the exact same exercise making vectors out of or axes out of these currents. So I can take the dominant principal component of each of the component currents that you saw one slide ago, and I can project the activity onto those. And that in the real example that I'm gonna show you in a minute, um, well, in five minutes or so, has gives you slightly more insight into what makes up the activity that you thought you were recording than just looking at um, you know, projection of the raw activity into state space. So just hold on to that thought for a second. So you know, we are, we, so you know, what do those principal component activities look like as a function of time? This is again, the component currents, currents from A to A here, currents from B to A here, currents from C to A here. And here's the first principal component as a function of time. The solid line is, is that first principal component over time. The dashed line is the ground truth, which I've extracted from multiplying the J with the sources, source currents from the, the generator model. And you see that the network does capture those features, right? Like the sequence starts at the right point and ends at some point, right? Like these time points match. When you move, when the fixed point moves from, you know, this time point to this time point, those line up. We've also obviously looked at the R squared or the co correlation coefficient of, you know, looking at the activity of B to A compared to the sequence and the currents from C to A compared to the fixed point. And those are more highly correlated than other than the other component currents. We've also looked at variance, variance captured and like that. And we're working on the methods paper that I will, you know, alert you to once it's posted on bioarchive. Right. So what are we what are we building this method up to do, right? So let's say experimentalists show up and give me a grab bag of neurons, right? They just say, here's all the activity we recorded on this particular experiment. What I would like for this method to be able to do is to identify whether a recording is from a single area or multiple areas. We're not quite there yet. 
Where we are are the other three things. So for example, if there is a difference between a dynamical difference between areas in terms of the G or the kind of inputs they get, or if there's a structural difference between the areas or the types of inputs each area receives, then curved or this current-based decomposition method can pick this up. And so we're still trying to explore what the failure modes of a method like this might be. But you know, really the strength would be if you gave me a grab bag and asked me, if this method can pick up if something is a pseudo population or a, or, a, or a single simultaneously recorded population. We're not quite there yet in terms of its sensitivity. And so with that, I would like to thank all of you for your attention. Once again, big shout out to Matt Perrick, uh, who's done some heroic um, work, both in, in, the, in the primate physiology world as well as here. Uh, Camille spencer Salmon, uh, Carl and Tyler for the generosity with the data and funding sources. Thank you. All right, so with this, we come to the close of today's uh, public sessions. Thank you all for your time and engagement and all the students and researchers who have signed up for the breakout rooms with the speakers. Uh, please do, uh, use the Zoom meeting links that you were sent uh, individually to head to your respective breakout rooms. And we hope to continue seeing this level of energizing enthusiasm over the next four days as NeuroFem India 2021 conference really hits its stride. We will be hearing from so many more amazing neuroscientists over the next few days, sharing their career journeys, research interests, and projects. Please don't forget our special events, the ALBA Network session on bias in Indian STEM. That's happening tomorrow. And the Ungender Workshop for Gender Awareness and Bias Sensitization, that's happening on April 12th. In order to get the most benefit out of this session, we encourage interested audience members to fill out a short and anonymized Google form with questions related to their attitude and supposition regarding bias that they encounter in their daily lives. The link to this will be displayed in the chat. Professor Shashi Bala Singh, director of Niper Hyderabad, will be starting off our scientific talk series tomorrow. And she will be giving us a broad view of systems and computational neuroscience research in India. If you have any questions regarding this conference, please free, uh, feel free to email biaswatchindia at gmail.com or use Twitter with the Twitter handles NeuroFemIndia21 or BiasWatchIndia. And thank you all of uh, thanks to all of you for joining us here on the first day of Neurofem India 2021 and have a good and fantastic evening. See you all tomorrow.